budget presentation at the work session and we had gone over five hours and so we started this meeting slightly early to um, try to wrap up that initial discussion of the budget. Um, still not for a vote to be approved tonight or anything like that but this is just a continuation of that discussion. So we're going to start the meeting um, in that frame and then I'm um, hoping by so that first hour because our meetings normally do start at six that around six o'clock we will be in our um, more like our regular <coughs> council meeting agenda, so that's why the agenda is set up like that. Okay. Um, so budget presentation continuation. Uh, Ms. Tucker, you wanna? Okay, so there are four departments remaining for um, budget presentations, and this is the order that will go tonight: um, town manager, town council, economic development, and parks. So we have my uh, budget, uh, and the only change to my budget is that um, uh, one, two, three, or four reverse interns um, that I hired, and since they have um, stayed on for such extended period of time, um, we can no longer call them interns now. So I am going to uh, just change their title to part-time um, workers, and that is the only addition that I have on my budget. Are there any questions on the town manager's budget? Yes, Mr. Williams? Mm -hmm. no. um, question is, uh, the reverse intern, is that in place of an assistant town manager or is an assistant town manager in the budget? Um, the assistant town manager position was always in the budget, so the reverse interns is not um, replacing um, the assistant town manager position. Okay, so that's in this, uh, what is it, I guess, the 218000 dollars figure that includes the assistant. Uh, that's correct. That was in the budget from last year as well. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, I noticed that uh, travel sustenance and lodging went up by 200%. Is there a reason behind that? Which line are you looking at? Uh, travel and sustenance. Very good. Very good. Went from 3,000 to 9,000. Um, no, that was actually a decrease from 10000 to 9000 Well, I'm talking about from last fiscal year, not the proposed 25 and the adjusted 25. I'm talking about from last year. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
from last year it was three thousand, and this year it's nine thousand. Um, correct. So initially, um, initially, I did not have use of a town vehicle, and so we had eaten up through this particular line item rather quickly, and having to pay for mileage for various. Um, trainings and uh, meetings that I had to attend across the state. So we increased that. And so that is for both uh, my position and the assistant town manager position when one is hired. Um, so an increase of $10,000 was warranted for this proposed um, fiscal year, but I did reduce that by $1,000 for a proposed $9,000 rate. You said you and assistant town manager do they need a car as well? Assistant town manager typically does not have um, a car when they're going long distances just to drive around town. Okay. So I got to Yeah, I see a note on there um, though also that that is to include the Fred Nats game and um, food for meetings. That's a note in the budget item that um, about some explanation of that line. Yeah, item. And if I can interject, uh, if you look at the actuals we spent in fiscal 2030, um, we spent $11,621, actually 23. In 24, we're already up to $7,749. And this also, besides um, when the town manager or assistant town manager goes for conferences, or training, um, this line item is what's used if they have to stay overnight and for buying food. Um, these are also like professional lunches where they have um, guests that they are entertaining or, or speaking with. Um, the Fred's Nat game goes toward um, our employees' uh, morale for a uh, detention um, strategy that we started using to reward them for all their hard work during the year. That's gone over really well, I've heard. Just to yes. note that the, the tickets are, have been in the past donated to them. They just have to pay for the food and the travel. The food and travel. Yeah, they get a box. Okay. And it's been donated, hopefully. Yeah. It'll be donated again this year. It makes it affordable and something nice. Sure. <laughs> That's right. One thing I've noticed. Uh, Contingency fund for the time entry went down significantly. Yes, you hear you're not. It's my fault. Hopefully, that worked right. Um, I noticed it went down significantly. I was just wondering if that you know, sufficient, if you have a sufficient amount of funds in your contingency fund, would it come down from 87000 to from last year's fiscal year proposed to 48000 this year? Well, I shared in the budget cuts that we uh, initiated across all departments. And so that is a line that it, we don't always have a definitive amount. Um, so in order to share with the budget cuts, in order to balance the budget, we went ahead and we cut that line since that is something that we never know um, how much um, we'll, we'll need. So, I think I have been the notes from the prior that our fiscal management, we do try to keep the contingency at $100,000. So this is significantly lower than what we would like it to be at in order to keep the budget balance. Good point. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to the next department. Okay, so next up is the town council budget. So this is our budget, really. <laughs> um, there have been no changes other than just adding the adding the amount for the AV upgrade. Um, so that's twenty thousand dollars of the difference between last year and this year, which the difference was thirty eight thousand six hundred two dollars and fifty six cents. Um, 20000 of that is one-time fee for the AV equipment and installation. 
Um, and then $2,040 was added for an AV technician at a rate of $85, which was based on the Lee Hartman quote, but $10 added just in case for an average of an hour of meeting as needed. Um, the remaining increase in the budget is to purchase and enter into an agreement with Civic Plus to add agenda and meeting management software to the website. Everything else pretty much stayed the same, if not went lower. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Williams. I don't know if I'm looking at the right thing or not, but um, under books and subscriptions, it was budget of 1000 this year, 24, according to the one we've shown, and now we're up to 14000 so that's like a 1300% increase. What's the, the So that is including that Civic Park subscription. So that's where they added the software. So that's a yearly, so it'll have like the initial implementation fee, and then it will be a yearly subscription, you know, a yearly fee for the website for that software to be added. In that line item under notes, that is that is written out there, addition of civic purchase subscription, $13,000 enhancement request. Do you have the one with the notes on it? Yeah, but I don't, I don't know what that is, so that's why I asked. Oh, you don't know the civic work. Okay. So it's going to be agenda and meeting software. So I will be able to stream from the website and not have to go through YouTube anymore. They integrate with Zoom too, so that's not going to be a problem. And we can do real in time voting. So, um, so when you guys are voting, I just click your names like yay and nay and it will pop up and show what your votes were and it also bookmarks to the footage and helps with minutes and there's also a transcription service that's included now too so it's all going to help streamline the minute taking and uh, agenda management so yes, it's going to help inform our citizens because we'll be able to do it Are there any other questions? Uh, just on the point of the Civic Plus stuff, uh, is there a demonstration that can be provided to the uh, council so we know what we're buying? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can set that up with uh, Mr. McCann on the demonstration. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Development, there were only two um, additional people go to the store. Sure, 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 sure. So on economic development, there were two items that were requested during this budget season, and um, they are highlighted there. One is an additional funding to help support additional hours that are required by Main Street. Um, when you have a part-time person, they need to work at least 20 hours, and that needs to be done at the latest next July. And the second piece is the facade grant, and uh, we are no longer asking for that at this moment. Okay. You're no longer asking for it? Correct. So we get to cut $20,000 out of the budget? Correct. Okay. You just got a Christmas card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, would like to, we would like to come back at a later time on that. Okay. So we're going to pause on that. Please. Okay. Okay, any other questions for economic development? Yes, Mr. Williams. Um, I know at one point it was discussed that um, downtown Colonial Beach would be kicking in for some of the 
part-time economic development director? There is currently a contract with Downtown Colonial Beach. Okay. Do you know how much that is? I guess it'll show up in the revenue section. It's $5,000. Just one um, question, Kelly. Since you all decreased the budget by twenty thousand, I know that you cut some other spaces. I once in a while would have hit me for this. But is there anywhere else that you were nervous about with cutting the budget that maybe you wanted? You know, like the tourism related, I know went down. That always makes me nervous because we depend so much on tourism. Is there you know, anything else that maybe you were a little nervous about that you wanted to play with? Um, I prefer to to leave the. the to not reduce the tourism. You know, if, if we had every, every wish, we'd leave the facade of Grand in. But at this moment, we understand that that needs to be paused. Okay. Any other questions in that? All right. Thank you. We've apparently exhausted everyone's energy from the five and a half hour budget meeting two weeks now. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. <laughs> and the grants, I'm sorry, I don't know if this isn't a question for Kelly, but just to point out that that is economic development, tourism, and grants. So our grants writer is in that budget as well. Correct. Okay. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, Parks budget has decreased regularly since 2022. And we're asking for an increase for next year. And you can see in the budget if you have any questions about those increases. It says park maintenance employee. And I just wanted to understand how, what exactly that entails. Well, because we interface with um, public works on a very regular basis, and part of what we would like to be able to do is have more interface opportunity with things like bathrooms being open and special events being managed and have someone who's on a part-time basis who's actually looking out for some of the needs of the parks department as we interface with public works because ours are it, they're not built into the schedule to be very regular so you know special events happen when they happen um, kind of like a park attendant when we had during COVID Kind of like a park attendant. Yeah. I think I imagine someone being available to, you know, yeah, to, I, I don't know that I can have someone, I don't know that there's someone out there who would be willing to split their day between opening bathrooms in the morning and closing them at night, but um, that's certainly an area where they could assist. So, I mean, there are a lot of things, especially as we grow um, and people, have expectations, and uh, I spend a lot of time opening doors at the community center and doing things like that for fitness classes. And, um, it doesn't take that much time, and it's good for me to interface with people who are there. But it would be great to have some some of that kind of help. Mr. Wood, I think that's how you can do that. Yeah, and just to kind of reinforce uh, what Sally's done this uh, past weekend for the Osprey budget, um, a couple of people. Yeah. My mic is on. Okay, there we go. I, I don't normally have a problem with people here. So <laughs> forgive me for speaking too, too low. But uh, this past weekend during the Osprey Festival, uh, a couple of ladies in Canada, there's no toilet paper in the ladies' room. Um, now, it turns out I think that was just uh, some miscommunication. But um, <coughs> because tourism is so important to us, it would be nice to have somebody who can take care of those things regularly. We run into situations, as the vice mayor knows, back on the rod run, oh, yeah. where it was a disaster, right? And so we don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, each of these events brings in a great deal of money to the town, uh, brings in a lot of money to our restaurants, our lodging. So for the sake of basically of a part-time employee uh, to ruin that relationship, I just don't think it makes sense. Okay. Yes. This is a kind of a silly question. Do our restrooms close at a certain time, or do you have the staffing to at 6 p.m. lock them? I know that we've had issues with vandalism. Not saying that can't happen during the day, but if I was a you know an audio teenager, I'd rather do it in the evening, sneak over for the yeah. Do our restrooms close right now? Chris can actually speak to that. They oh, do have a schedule. Thanks, Chris. Uh, 
Um, they're opened every morning by 7 a.m. and usually they're closed at dawn, dusk, whatever comes first. Um, but they are locked at night by a you know, public works employee who's out on the road to secure them. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Ray. Just a couple questions. Um, one question: uh, do, What would you say that there's a? I can't remember what the increase was. <coughs> But that would you say it was a part-time? That's a part-time position. And in fact, when I was hired, I was hired as a part-time assistant to Bobby Duke, who was the full-time parks director. <coughs> Since then, you've had me only as a part-time person with a lot of volunteers. And I don't know that I can always depend on volunteers for everything we do. And so are you going to stay part-time? I, I hope to. <laughs> uh, and then another question. I noticed that Mulch was on here, so I guess I don't know if that used to be on the public works budget and it's moved over to Parks and Rec. That actually was a request from town council when I did my mulch presentation. You all recommended that we look at an annual top off of the mulch. And so we determined that that would be appropriate for to come out of the park budget because it was specifically related to the playground areas of the parks. And I'd like to interject here. The mulch was never in the budget for public works either. Um, this all came to fruition last year. We had to redo all the parks with mulch. Um, so as we said, we have put maintenance here um, for the parks each year. Uh, that will be continued in here. Um, there is no money in the budget for public works for mulch. We put it here at Parks and Rec to make sure that it goes where it needs to be going. Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams, remember we had that presentation about the ADA compliance and the mulch not being uh, high enough and all that kind of stuff, and the, the gentleman came out. Um, part of that Parks and Rec thing was, as we, uh, I don't remember the actual figure, but when we replenished everything, it was a time when we decided that uh, Parks and Rec needed to have a replenished thing so we didn't get out of compliance again um, with that Parks and Rec uh, mulch, and we, you know, we picked the certain type of mulch that we picked and all that kind of stuff, so. And I just wonder, is, so is, because uh, I saw the Public Works employees doing all that, the original. Right? Correct. So are they going to still do it, or are we trying to try I to hope work? they'll help me out. Yes. yes, Public Works will continue to do that on, with our staff, with the Parks Department paying for the materials. Oh. Right. Thank you. So we're just simply being transparent with the numbers and then showing the, the cost yes. If there were other maintenance needs in parks um, that come up for safety or other concerns, would that need to be in this budget then? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't have the answer to that. Um, we did not anticipate, the reason the mulch became part of the budget is because that mulch had gone for more than a couple of years, I think, without being replenished. And so the idea was that if we would continue to stay on top of it on an annual basis. I don't have an issue with the mulch. I'm just saying right. if there are other maintenance or safety concerns well, in other parts. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. If there is no contingency in your budget to okay. add anything else. To Madam Mayor, <laughs> and that's one of the, the, the uh, duties that we'll give to this uh, maintenance person okay. that we're hiring that they um, check for safety issues and report those back. Um, at this point, unless we come up with something, I mean, we'll probably pay for those out of public works, um, or we can add money if you desire, council desires, into uh, the parks and rec budget for those items for, for an emergency or, or repairs, more repairs money. Um, that is up to council, but it was never there before. This is, you know, if the parks is, um, an evolving department, right? Um, and as we start adding more things, we add the, the stuff to Eleanor Park and the park at the north side. Um, you'll see steadily increases in parks and right, to maintain them and to make sure they're safe. And just to be oh, sorry. hold on, at Dr. Salt Sullivan has her hand, so I just want to make sure I get her. Um, where I know in the past year or two, we've had to replace. Um, a basketball bat board. We've had to do major repairs at the bathrooms. I think there were some minor repairs done to the fencing in different locations. Where has that, what, 
was that budgeted for? How was that paid for? It was paid out of building and grounds. Okay. So which now is we're trying to budget from related to the parks. We're trying to get into the parks for the budget. Um, so um, either Chris found the money or we used some contingency money that they may have had. Um, the building and grounds is under public works. Yes. The building and grounds is under public works. That's why we're trying to move those kind of things into the parks and rec so that the parks and rec director is the one controlling and, and managing these items for parks. So keeping an eye on those expenses over the next year may help us determine what we should budget through parks and rec. Correct. We can in the future. And just for clarity, the Public Works Department has a schedule of maintenance for playground equipment. So if we run into things like that, whether a parks part-time person sees it or someone in Public Works, they actually do check the equipment on the regular. So we know when there's graffiti on, on the playground or when there's, you know, a, a bolt that's too loose or whatever, because they do check that. I mean, Chris can speak okay. to the scheduling of that, but I know that they do it. Are there any other questions? Mr. Not, Williams? not for this, but after we're done this, can go back? I have a question. Okay. I think, is that the last department on the list of departments? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then we'll go back. Do what? Um, the question I had was uh, since. Uh, Thank you, Scott. Since grants is under economic development, and I know that JC is left, or is he left? He's not. Yes, okay. he's left. Um, so, are we, we have budgeted for another full time grant writer in here, or are we doing a part time one, or are we looking for one, or not? Uh, the, yeah, so a full time grant um, person is budgeted in there. Yes, yeah, in the audience. Okay. I think that the job is posted on the website. Is the opening posted online? Um, that particular one isn't um, yet because we have we're having some internal discussions about um, some things, but that will be posted soon. Yes. And we might need an HR director. Correct. Okay. For those that weren't with us at our work session meeting, uh, it's holding up a lot of staffing issues. Um. Okay, any other question on these departments? Okay, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule. Are there questions? Um, Natasha, you wanna recap anything? So at the um, previous meeting, there were some revisions that council requested. And so we did those revisions and the um, Excel spreadsheets were emailed to council. So we will now um, just go through those scenarios with the different um, revisions that were asked for. Um, one of the revisions was to um, find additional funding to be able to meet the um, $100,000 for the volunteer fire department, um, budget the HR manager position for uh, full time as opposed to the part time, uh, six months that we originally had budgeted. Um, no adjustments? Oh, the adjustments for so planning and zoning. Correct adjustments made in planning and zoning. So Lisa will now go through the um, revisions and discuss uh, the financial impacts of those revisions. So the first sheet we did the revisions um, as Natasha just outlined, um, and with those changes, uh, we ended up um, no changes to what we had uh, presented before the two percent on the meals lodging and cottage tax. Um, so adding and subtracting, uh, so adding the 12.5 for the fire department and the salary benefits for a full, uh, full year of HR, and then the adjustments we made to planning and zoning, the total difference um, came out to be $24,840.94 uh, that we were now short without uh, finding some more revenue. And so that was your, your one that was just labeled with council revisions. But that was before the economic development cut? Yes, out of the exactly. Industry. Okay. So then, um, because we didn't at that time know that Kelly was going to um, reduce the reduce reducers, um, um, we had sent you another 
um, scenario to make up that deficit where we um, let's see, added an increase to the real estate of one penny. And that ended up giving us a surplus of 35,159.06. Uh, so real estate roughly gives us $60,000 per penny. And that was presented to you. And then, so we had that surplus, we looked at uh, reducing the increase in the meals and lodging to 1.5% instead. But, it, but if we reduce the meals, lodging, and cottage tax to a 1.5 increase, uh, actually gives us a big deficit of $124,326.38. So we've given you these. We're trying to come up with the um, where, um, from council's direction, um, what they would like us to do. So if you take the first scenario with no change to the meals, lodging, and cottage, it would still be 2%. Then we have the, the deficit of twenty-four thousand, which Kelly has not graciously given up for twenty thousand um, dollars. So with any no other ads or anything, we would still be short roughly four thousand dollars. So this this is um, our proposal. Um, so we were looking for direction from council on how they would like us to approach it. Yes, Mr. Wood. I think I probably speak for a lot of us <clears throat> that I really don't have an appetite to raise real estate taxes. And we're we're four grand like right now, right? That's what it basically was. So um, I think it's me personally. I think it would be foolish to uh, reduce the proposed increase on the meals and lodging. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming somewhere, Ms. Tucker, Ms. Oaks. There's four thousand dollars in the cardboard box somewhere. I can take the uh, metal detector and find some fire treasure. I like, but we ought to be able to find four thousand dollars. I'd like to discuss that point though, because I'm actually a little concerned about how tight a couple different things are. Number one, in our revenue projection, um, you're estimating collecting personal property tax at ninety percent, which has never been done. So that to me seems to be an over projection of our tight. It just it's an ambitious projection. Um, it, it is, but I do have a reasoning behind that. Okay. So we, we discussed it. So we had um, contracted with tax to do our real estate delinquencies. Right. And we are seeing um, a great increase in the collection that we're getting sure. um, from this service. Um, and we had started talking to them about taking over personal property also. Smart. So we figured if we hire them or contract with them to go ahead and start doing our delinquent personal property, then we can expect an increase there. So we're usually budgeting at 85, we're budgeting at 90. We figured we can at least get a 5% from them handling those delinquencies. Um, it might be a little ambitious, but um, they've done so well on real estate and we're expecting the same kind of return on personal property. Yeah, so that, that's that's just one of the flags in the revenue that made me a little bit nervous. So the last one we want to do is set up a budget that's going to come in with, you know, uh, an imbalance at the end of the year. That's just not smart planning. That always costs the town money in the end. So, um, but I did look up lodging taxes that are around us, and um, I actually think the two percent in lodging is low. I think it, there's a possibility to go to 3% in lodging because Virginia Beach is at 9%, Sandbridge is at 10.5%, that's like also Shigatik area, Kilmarnock is at 8%, Fredericksburg's at 8%. So we're really below market on lodging tax. And um, I think that's going to capitalize on our tourist industry, which really needs to pay a fair share towards our budget. So I'm just, I'm a little concerned about how tight the cushion is, especially in the contingency fund and the town manager, where those that line item, which is not a lot of money, goes to things that are unanticipated costs, which always happen. I mean, we cannot walk forward with our eyes shut on that. 
Um, yes, but I mean, if you if you really look at it, the adopted budget of a nine million dollars is now close to eleven million for fiscal twenty four. Yeah, and a lot of that has been money that we've had to um, pull from contingency. Um, it's CIP. You know, it's it's different items. It's it's money we've asked council to um, provide. There's so much we're staying balanced. You know. That's good. Uh, okay. I saw hands on this side, and then I'll come. And I saw Krista also. You want me to go to this side first? And they would wait. So okay. Go All right. I'll go, Mr. Wood. I saw his hand first, and then I saw you. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, all I was going to say is reinforce what uh, the mayor said. It's something that actually Ms. Tucker and I have discussed is for perhaps at least running the numbers to see if we did increase uh, the meals tax to see what kind of budget position that would put us in. I do agree that we don't want to come up with a budget when we don't have enough money, uh, but also to not do it on the max for everything. So, thank you. Mr. Williams? I was just going to suggest with the money being as tight as it is that somebody added two thousand dollars for the local radio station i think that might not be appropriate because things as tight as we that they are and we're pulling the money from the fire department or digging it out here and there just to fund the minimum stuff so and i've got a lot of complaints from constituents about that. so radio station is a lot of free services for us they make all of our public service announcements on their radio station for nothing uh, they come to our events and provide music for nothing um, and I do think they really add um, to our community. The only complaints I've seen about this are on a very misleading Facebook page. Well, so I agree. Know some of the council members and local people. So you can I pay mean, for that as well if you wish to have your name on the radio they station. They also asked it of you, you too. Regarding the radio station, um, we have been we have had in our budget. Um, the ability for local nonprofits that do free services for our community for many, many years. And many others are getting a little bit of money, 500, 1,000 um, here and there. And um, I think the radio station provides as much service um, as any of those other local nonprofits do. Unless you're talking about cutting off all funding for all nonprofits, but that would be including the rescue squad and the fire department. <laughs> Um, is that, if that's your proposal, to make it across the board, board, not pick at one one particular organization because you don't like it. Would you care to disclose your affiliation with the radio station? I serve on five or six different boards for nonprofits in this town. So it's not just the radio station. I also donate personally to those nonprofits. And they advertise for your business on a regular basis? They don't advertise. It's a community radio station, and there is no advertisement. You can become an underwriter, and you can do that as an individual or as a business, and you pay for it. And that's what helps support the radio station. All right, we're going to move forward because $2,000 is really getting into pennies over a $10 million budget. So let's just put that into perspective. Um, Ms. Robertson? I just wanted to ask if anyone talked to Sandbridge about how everything, when they increase theirs, when they get to their community, because I know we are about the same size. Yeah, I had it. I didn't talk to Sandbridge, but I did talk to the Kilmarnock mayor, who also owns the inn of Kilmarnock. So he is the most affected by lodging tax, and uh, his he actually supported the eight percent. So. But I didn't, I didn't read that as a Yeah. And I mean, Kilmarnock is pretty yeah. close. Uh, Madam Mayor, are you talking about just lodging or meals and lodging? That's just the lodging. <laughs> just the lodging and cottage. As, 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 as I've discussed with you and other people, I have concerns about increasing the meals tax simply because that's not just tourism and meals. That is um, all of the people that live here and work here. And, and eat out on a regular basis to support our local businesses. And for example, if you have a family of four that um, that spends $100 a week eating out, this change will cost them $104 in a year. If you have a property owner that has a $400,000 house, a 1% increase in, in property taxes is gonna cost them $40. So it's looking at that 
impact and the difference in that that I have concerns about. No, I was just referring to the cottage and lodging, specifically the cottage and lodging. Yes. I think most of it has been kind of covered, but I wanted to do a little bit of piggyback off um, Mr. Wood and, and you, Mayor, as well. The last time we had our meeting two weeks ago, we discussed the rate for meals and lodging, and we did compare. I think we were, I was on my phone like looking really quick, and our meals and lodging are, are very below standard for this area. So in my opinion, I would rather raise lodging, maybe keep meals the same where the proposed budget was, um, and then not raising the real estate by a penny if we can if we can do that. If that would put us around the same spot, if we raise lodging another percent, I'd like to be I'd be curious to see where that lands us as far as over but or you know a balanced budget. I just want to clear we're gonna have to hold a public hearing. We're not making this decision tonight. This is just to have some discussion ahead of um advertising or um, public hearing. So we're not looking for a decision on it just kind of We'll have more opportunity for input in the next couple of meetings as well. Mr. Um, I'm just uh, perplexed about the hundred dollars a week for people eating out because I have a family of six and it's like one hundred eighty dollars every time we go out to dinner. So, and we go two or three times a week because of either school or games or <coughs> going to local eateries to help. So the meal tax would significantly impact your budget. Absolutely. <laughs> you have a grown boy. That's not definitely. Kenny's <laughs> mine's already. <laughs> <laughs> and he's only four. Yeah, Mr. Earlier. What was the exact proposal from our last meeting? It was to raise one or the other? Well, I think both at two percent. Meals, lodging, and cottage taxes, two percent. <laughs> But not sales tax, not like groceries or going to sales tax is run by the state. Okay, so I just want to make sure that's clear. There may be some confusion about which. Well, and and to be fully clear, when you when you go out to eat, there's five point three percent from the state sales tax. There's currently five percent from the town, and so this is going to that. So that's ten point three, and it's two more percent is going to make it. 12.3% every time you go out to McDonald's. I don't care if you're going to the cheapest restaurant in town or the most expensive restaurant in town. That is an increase in what it costs the residents who live here year round and support the businesses year round. So just to be clear, you're saying you'd rather have it in real estate tax increase than in meals. I'm just making the comparison of the impact on on a, whether the impact is across the board or if it's affecting families right so you could it, it just depends on how much your house is is valued at as to how much it would go up but for four hundred thousand dollar property owner a one percent a one cent increase would only be forty dollars a year so again i think in order to compare to a two percent meals tax revenue we are talking about a four cent increase real estate it's, it's not, do you see what I'm saying? I'm just yeah, trying one, to understand. One penny of real estate gives us roughly $60,000. Right. 1% of meals tax would roughly give us $109,000. 1% of lodging would give us roughly $13,000. And on cottage, is, it's like, I don't know if I might not be correct. Um, so, forty. It, it's, okay. yeah, so it's, Meals and lodging, that, that increase gives you more money than one penny of real estate. Right, I understand that. I'm looking at the impact on our citizens. I understand. Mr. Wood? Would it be possible to do this? Could the council give uh, folks direction to give us an idea of what each in combination would be? Okay, so that we're we're not dealing with a hypothetical numbers, but a 2% increase could be with 3% increase. Uh, and both with and without uh, big tax. Is that possible to do without being honest? I just want to make sure we give clear direction on this. So I think there is, what you're asking for is a uh, 
a revenue projection of no meals tax increase and instead real estate? No, no, I have absolutely none real estate. Jamal. Okay. Um, because they've already state. provided a couple different scenarios, so I just don't want them spinning their wheels on. Yeah, well, no, nor do I. But so that we can see exactly what we're dealing with revenue wise, taking it from two percent to three percent, and taking it to the three percent without the meals tax. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes. If you give me clear direction on what percentages you want, if it's different from meals, lodging, cottage, that's fine. As long as I know what percentage increase that you would desire, whether or not to add real estate in there or not, I can give you scenarios of where we fall, surplus or deficit. Did we get consensus just on those items? Be very clear about exactly which items. What was it? Was I not clear? Was I, did you understand what I was asking? For? Yeah, I, I would like it to be. To go back over it again, we can write it all down what we want to do so we have, are quite clear. So, what I heard Council was um, say it seems like a scenario on an increase in the lodging um, 1%. Well, we were already at the 2%, so bring it up to 3% or 4% with no increase in the meal. That's never going to cover that. And that's not even going to lodging and cottage. Yes. Lodging and lodging. cottage, but not meals and not real estate. Is that correct? Right. So I want to people be able to see what we can and can't cover. By the okay. So you want a scenario with 3% cottage and lodging, but no meals tax increase. And then also. And it, okay. The same thing. 3 and 4% with no meals. Okay. No meals tax increase from the proposed budget or that's, none for this year. That's going to be like a quarter of a million dollar deficit. Well, I don't want to not spend any time on what, some of this. What, what's going to be the meals tax is projecting to increase uh, revenue by almost uh, it's what two hundred forty thousand dollars. Right. And so by having the comparison, people uh -huh. can see why this is needed. Why we need to go into the three percent. So yes. I don't want to go to three percent meals. Yeah, this is two percent meals, is meals increase would give you roughly one hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars. So we take that off. You're going to take. But, yeah. The cottage and lodging tax is off. only forty thousand dollar increase. But really, that's all we need. Okay, so I think what this is four thousand dollar deficit. I'm going to try to clarify. this. I think yeah. my understanding is we have. The original, the original proposed budget was with a two percent increase to meals and a two percent increase to lodging and cottage. But let's try to cover the gap here by doing a two percent to meals and a three percent to lodging and cottage. And then we can know, I mean, the, what the equivalent of the meals percentage is. To the real estate rate because, to answer Karen's question, I believe, because there will that number, if it's a hundred and or if it's two hundred, I think it's like two hundred and forty thousand dollars divided by sixty, and that's four cent, it'd be four cent increase in real estate to cover the meals portion. So what I'm hearing is that you're comparing apples and oranges. I'm talking about the numbers. numbers. I'm not I'm talking about the impact on a residence, not on the not on the people that come here to visit and spend money. And my point was, you got, if you do, if you did, a, and we all know that taxes are eventually going to go up. If you did a one cent tax increase this year, the impact on a property that was worth $400,000 would be $40 a year. That's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at it from the citizen side. Yeah, but you're, uh, I'm saying that it's four cents to cover with the interest in meals and meals tax. We are sharing that tax with everyone who is not a local. I, we're still yes, it's not just the locals that eat here. Right. We have a lot of tours that come here and they do eat. Because if you're local, you have your own refrigerator, you get your grocery store. If you're a tourist, you don't have a refrigerator with you, you don't have, you know, you can go to the grocery store and make sandwiches or whatever, but you don't have kitchen, you don't have you know, is there is there a consensus before we spend more effort on a budget process that's already 
very lengthy, is there, uh, is there a majority that would like to look at an increase in real estate tax? No. It's already been presented in the spreadsheets that we were given. But you're asking for more work on that, and I don't want to no, give I'm directive not asking for a single on person's that. initiative. I'm not asking for more work on that. Okay. I'm not asking for any of that. I'm, okay. just, I'm just making a point okay. of the impact on citizens, not just tourists, with increasing the meals tax even more. Okay, I understand the point. Okay, so so far I have to do the show lodging and the cottage at three and four percent with no meals tax increase, and then the second scenario with keeping the two percent meals tax and adding a percent to cottage and lodging. That's how I understand it. Okay. Okay, that's good. Anything else? Anything else? Balance. Oh, right. Balance it. We're making wishes. I yeah. wish we could go back to last year. <laughs> Stay where we were on that. Well, I wish prices hadn't gone up either, David, but they have all across the country. I know, but Davenport's also pointed out that our spending is increasing by 7% a year. And he said that that was fine. So. Our spending is because of the increasing costs and salaries for retaining our employees. Um, it's not like we're spending money on things that we don't need. Um, but you can speak to the public works director. You can speak to any of the directors on how much extra money that services and supplies are costing. Um, it, it is what it is. Um, and if we don't grow our revenue at that same rate, we're going to always be sitting here doing this. Well, I do think after the Berkeley presentation, it's very clear that we need to show our employees the respect they deserve. Just being selfish, we need to retain employees. And, uh, you know, the institutional knowledge that's in practice. So, honestly, again, Pennywise and Town Foolish, it's time we find that to be wise. All right, so we're going to bring back the last couple scenarios to the next work session meeting. Is that my understanding? Yes. Natasha? Yes. And um, I have one more thing to add. I believe it was Dr. Karen who had um, suggested that uh, Chris speak with the employed um, people regarding um, some of the items um, that were projected in that budget. And so just today, um, we were provided with some changes in two line items, um, namely the sludge and chemical line items. So since we have provisions to present you at the next meeting, we will ask that report to provide um, numbers from their presentation, and we will present the updates on those items uh, at the next meeting for you all to consider it. Well, so you're talking about water and sewer? The water and sewer, right. Yeah, okay. especially sewer, because those two items are for the wastewater treatment plan. Um, so there is, uh, it's a significant amount of money. Um, so we really went down for to go run that scenario for you again that he presented before, okay. and then we'll present all that to you. And voting can be here at the public hearing. That's fine. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, if that's good for this, I'm going to take just a five minute recess and then we'll regroup into our regular meeting at six o'clock.
Before we move forward, I just wanted to um, review the budget agenda um, as for the schedule. Are we setting the public hearing now at the regular uh, May meeting? Would be my understanding. We'll talk about it one more time in the work session and be ready to set a public hearing at the regular May meeting for the tax uh, rate setting. And then we will still have the month of June to approve the actual budget. Yeah. I think we have it. Is that a good schedule? We have to approve the first uh, work session in June. Okay. So, and if we can, we probably go to the first okay. in June. Okay. Heather, are you good on that schedule? Right when meeting public hearing for budget and tax rates. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. And if we need to take more time on it after that, we can, but we hold that at least the public hearing portion of that. Okay. Uh, next up is our consent agenda. Approval of minutes, April 3rd, January 12th. Um, the resolution to appoint, we got um, two applicants to our Person Rec Advisory Commission. Um, and budget amendments for the Water and Sewer Fund and the town manager to suspend enforcement um, of section 13.1-32 so that the town can hold a one-day town-wide yard sale event. That's the $5 fee you have to pay for the yard sale. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve the consent agenda as published. You have a second? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, next up is the the water and sewer amendments, please. They're in tab B of our packets. Utility shutoff fees had unbudgeted revenue, and so that's to bring that in. And then the other one is. Um, processing fees, wastewater processing fees from the county. So it was 150,000, correct? Correct. Okay. Just to All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 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 Yes. Fantastic. All right. Council member announcements. Uh, Mr. Wood, start with you. That's right. Okay. Uh, first of all, I wanted to let uh, folks know that I took a tour of the water sewer treatment plant with the Bowden, and um, yes, I, and I'll reveal my uh, association with the radio station. I gave people a tour that I took at the same time of the <coughs> plant. What we've discovered is, first of all, the test results are way down from the last day of the previous administration to today. The numbers have improved markedly. Um, DEQ it seems to be terribly pleased with the improvements that we've made. Um, the other thing is that uh, if you want to hear the tour yourself, so you can become a bit of an expert on it, uh, the interview is going to be November 9th at 8 p.m., May 11th at 9 a.m. So that's a good way for folks to get caught up with all the changes and the improvements at the wastewater treatment plant. There's just one other thing. Did you say November? I'm sorry, May, May. Um, thank you, May 9th and um, May 11th. The other thing that I wanted to uh, just ask the, the chief a couple of questions about. Uh, we don't presently have an all points broadcast of emergency. So if, for instance, we had an active shooter situation or a uh, weather disaster, other than uh, the code reds, and only about half of our citizens subscribe to that, would you think that having the radio station being able to broadcast instructions and tell citizens what to do in those emergencies would be a force multiplier for you? Yes, whether, whether it was a, uh, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, Especially you mentioned the, the active shooter. 
for us to be able to get information out to the public um, to allow us to work, do our work that we have to do and, and to allow them to get the, the uh, quickest access to their family members uh, to reunite them, I think would be valuable. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I have for this evening. Man. Okay, Mr. Williams. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's working. Great. Um, from the Planning Commission, uh, they had their last meeting um, uh, last week, and several of the items they discussed. First off, uh, Natasha gave them an overview of the capital improvement plan budget, and she went over some of the highlights from last year. Um, for example, the central drainage area and the HVAC for the town. Um, they also mentioned uh, a couple of new projects for this year, including um, Public Works Inflow and Inundation Study, uh, which uh, I need to find a little bit more about that because I'm not sure if we've done studies, but this may, is, Natasha, is that study actually for um, doing the smoke testing and stuff? Um, that, are you referring to the IMS study? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one that we Okay, I was thinking we did that and we were just doing the smoke testing. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Um, let's see, uh, they mentioned the Boundary Street bathrooms, also pump station refurbishment um, on Denison, uh, and then also Denison well abandonment project. Um, these are just some things that are, you know, in the draft. Um, a planning commission member uh, brought up the peer refurbishment and asked some questions about that and whether that included just regular maintenance or if it included engineer additional engineering studies and whatnot. Um, and they also asked, uh, let's see, about the water meters, which we brought up at our last meeting, um, and what was going on with that, especially with the communication system concerns. Um, our planning commission, uh, let's see, asked about the new municipal center, and I think it was $9.5 million that was in there, um, and what that entailed. Let's see, they also um, voted to approve their parking ordinance. Uh, it's Article 13. Um, there was some minor uh, amendments to that. It wasn't major, but that'll come to council next. Um, they also talked about their work plan and I'll put in feedback to some of the things that they wanted to uh, cover uh, in that work plan. Uh, one of them was administrative variances. Another one was updates to the zoning map and text amendments. Um, another one was the review of, uh, let's see, our, um, review of R2 and uh, multifamily housing and uh, also Example, example that would be duplexes or one over one apartments. Um, they also discussed uh, creation of an inclusionary housing zone. Um, it's one of the topics that they'd like to tackle. Um, and then also non conforming lots and potential uses. And um, some of the examples they brought up were like vegetable gardens. Um, and then also they discussed the comprehensive plan. And that's one of the things that's uh, definitely on their agenda. And so that's all I got. And also, just to mention, the Kona Beach uh, Housing and Redevelopment Authorities meeting is tomorrow night. If anybody's bored, it's 4.30 tomorrow. It's kind of early, but uh, it'll be right here at the town center. Thank you. David, do they vote on CIP? No. No. no is that going to help to us to have a budget? Next meeting, yes. I'll have a public hearing. Okay, so you guys are a little bit far behind in the schedule then. Because CIP should really be ahead of the budget cycle. The, the minutes from the last meeting said the 18th, but I'll clarify that one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll they've check actually them. rescheduled for the 25th. Okay. Yeah. They've rescheduled. Okay, thank you. So they're going to be the 25th at 4.30. Okay, thanks. David, quick question also um, with the with the with um, with your committee. Um, and I don't know if this is more of Mr. Julie's responsibility, but with the season coming in, there are definitely some homes that are derelict and uninhabitable. What is the course of action? Is that something we would bring to your committee to discuss? Is this truly an uninhabitable, vacant home? Is that something that would be addressed at your meetings? 
it would be addressed through it would be addressed through our code enforcement uh, portal on our website. That would be the place to start. Okay. And then we would go out and do an investigation to find out is there any zoning violation okay. out there and take appropriate action. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, just a few things. First, I'd like to commend everyone who was a participant in the um, Osprey Festival. It's a lot of fun. Um, the kids were absolutely wonderful on stage. It, it was just there were so many things that you could participate in, learn about. Even the Osprey that were a little daunting to look at because of those uh, nails that they had to Nails, but anyway, um, and um, I also attended my first alliance uh, meeting today, and I will have more um, and at next uh, meeting. And for those of you fresh off the press, and I will try and get some of these out, but this is everything that goes on in this town from Parks and Rec. It's it's thick, and some days we have multiple things going on. Um, I'm going to put some of these around town in the coffee shop, and, and both of them. we'll get more if we have to, right, Sal? Yep. Okay, and I'm sure you're going to tell more about this, but um, it was really um, something to see in such, yeah, she's a busy lady. So, thank you, Dr. Sosan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm the liaison with the schools, and I've been meeting with Dr. Mitchell and attending the school board meetings. They did approve their budget at the last meeting, and that is now available to be viewed and reviewed on their website. Um, another thing that happens on a regular basis is the students, if you want to know what's going on with the school, the students make weekly announcements um, on WWER, our community radio station. Um, graduation dates have been set, um, so mark, mark your calendars. The class of 2024, Colonial Beach Elementary School, 7th grade, is on May 16th at 6 p.m., in the elementary school gymnasium and the Colonial Beach Elementary School Kindergarten graduation ceremony is May 16th in the state in the gymnasium at 9 a.m. And Dr. Mitchell will be filling us in on some other wonderful things that are going on at the schools with his report. Um, Ms. Brown. Okay, just a few things. Um, first, I want to thank the chief as usual, and I always do this, um, and obviously all of our public works goes without saying, but our uh, police department, thank you for the Osprey Festival pictures of your officers participating. We love that. It's great community policing. I think that is definitely what our town is about, so love seeing the posts about that. Thank you. I um, also wanted to uh, publicly thank the Colonial Beach Moose Lodge. Uh, they made a donation to the police department, which is appreciated. Um, this Saturday, if you want a delicious lunch, Colonial Beach Volunteer Fire Department is having a barbecue dinner. Um, it starts at 12 p.m. You can grab it and go it, or you can even dine in at the firehouse. Um, there's only 50 dinners, so it's going to be supplies are limited. So get there as soon as you can. It's $15. You get half a barbecue chicken, beans, corn on the cob, roll. Um, like I said, you can eat in or eat out. And then one of our more important items I wanted to touch on is um, it's become public since the last uh, meeting, um, and we've had some press releases. As everyone knows, the Westmoreland Department of Emergency Services is going to be teaming with the Colonial Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad. Um, there was a joint press release between them um, and the town, kind of a, a triple um, press release, but it's been going really well. They're now in discussions on their own. Um, I just wanted to um, more than anything congratulate the citizens. We're still going to have our volunteer rescue workers that we know and love. We're still going to have them be able to respond and do fun things in our community. We're going to get some enhanced um, enhanced medical care as well, um, some advanced life support um, things for our citizens as well. So it's really important for them all to team up, and it's finally going to happen, and it's, it's happening nicely and smoothly. So something to look forward to. Um, so our Colonial Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad is not going away. They're just going to be enhanced. 
um, if you will. So that's good news. And last but not least, um, the next neighborhood watch meeting is at the police station, April 25th at 5.30. Um, and something that Lieutenant Thompson um, um, is bringing to the table is some more educational component to the meeting. So um, I was able to attend one so far this year. I won't be able to attend uh, April 25th. Um, but the meeting, not only does citizens talk, it's a great spot for citizens to meet. It's always a sold out show. If you wanna know where all the people are, they're at the neighborhood watch meeting, like 30 residents were there last time. Yeah, it's it's really a hit. So, um, so if you want to go to the police station and hang out with the, the police, that'd be great. And again, this edu educational component could be something as uh, you know, safety tips, um, tips to secure your home or your Airbnb while you're away, to business tips. So um, definitely try hitting up one of those meetings again, April 25th at 5.30 p.m. Thank you. Mr. Allison. Good evening, everybody. We are in budget season, if you didn't know. Um, also from finance, we have uh, business licenses are due on May 1st. Um, also, if you run a short-term rental, you must obtain a business license for your short-term rental along with your permit. Um, side note, uh, there is an alumni softball game on May the 4th. I'd be in trouble if I didn't mention that. Uh, since the Clinton Beach Boosters are helping to solidify that and Everyone knows what a great time it is to watch Ms. Fitz still play softball. Um, also, just so everybody's aware that in our consent agenda, what was discussed in Section D, the uh, town-wide yard sale, the proposed date for that is May the 25th. Um, so that was a really big hit last year. Um, I know it's been on Facebook multiple times about when the next one's coming, that kind of stuff. So uh, look forward to that. And if you have anything, you know, you're spring um, cleaning and stuff like that you want to sell something make sure you get your uh, get on the list and you can get on the little map that uh, Sally puts together and we can have a wonderful uh, town yard sale that's all I have. thank you um yeah that's been a wonderful thing that you really kind of list out the yard sale and um I just want to also note that at that May 4th alumni softball game, we will be honoring um, the late Fred Dodge, who was a longtime uh, softball coach and my softball coach and I played there as well. Um, huge influence to a lot of young women here in Clinton Beach. Um, on that note, I think I can, um, I'd be remiss to not mention that we have lost three very significant uh, members of our community just very recently, and I would just like to uh, pay condolences to them by just a, a brief moment. Um, Ms. Betty Whitestone, who spent uh, decades and decades of her life committed to tourism in this town. Um, a Mr. Everett Mothershead, who is uh, one of our uh, special needs adults here in this community, but also a warm heart and a giant, um, just kind person um, that we saw for my whole lifetime, um, riding around Colonial Beach and the Mother's Head family who, um, his brother passed a couple years ago, who was a long time employee with the town, Ronnie. And um, the Mother's Head family is just very close to this community and this town. And then most recently, I just, uh, news um, that Ms. Joe Townsend has passed, um, who was a fourth grade teacher for many years and a realtor in this community, and uh, the Townsend family is also um, in our hearts. So I just want to um, give just a brief moment right now for them. Um, as I feel like in the essence of Betty Whitestone, she would want the show to go on in many ways. She was a woman of a lot of character and enthusiasm. If you ever met her at the visitor center and very welcoming to our tourists and residents. And in that same um, vein, I'd like to just congratulate all of the people that it takes to put on the Virginia Osprey Festival in this town. Um, it is grown significantly. The 
not just Colonial Beach Town Osprey Festival, the State of Virginia Osprey Festival, which could become the National Osprey Festival one day. Um, it has grown into a 501c3 organization that works um, with protecting these migratory birds, but also in uh, environmentalism and supporting the natural habitats that serve them. You should know that we have over 30 nests here in the town of Colonial Beach because I did the trolley tour, which was fantastic. And um, we are thriving as an Osprey community, which not all communities can say right now, to be totally honest with you. So um, I just want to say congratulations to all the event coordinators. I saw people from all over the state come here for this. It was a massive conglomeration of environmentalist groups too, and it really highlights what we love about our community here um, and the wildlife and the beautiful place that we live. Um, Along with that, I attended the Westmoreland Board of Supervisors meeting, um, which, as uh, Ms. Brown mentioned, uh, included the vote to uh, support the Volunteer Rescue Squad with Westmoreland EMS services. I really want to thank um, Mr. Williams, who came to support the effort, and Mr. <coughs> Wood and uh, Dr. Self Sullivan, who had come at the prior meeting also in support of that effort. I know there's support across the board here, but that really um, I think Krista's leadership in this uh, has really gone a long way as well, and I just think it's been um, just a fabulous collaboration. I know our um, supervisor, Tim Trivet, is going to speak more about this in his time up here, so I won't delve in um, any deeper at this moment. Uh, also, the EDC meeting was last week. Um, uh, we'll be doing a budget presentation at the next EDC meeting with them, and also working on um, with VDOT for some additional crosswalks downtown, which is a request to the foundation. And um, oh, I have one more thing. Yes, sorry, I had a lot of notes scratched on this piece of paper. Um, if you didn't know, and I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself on this, but our little community theater, we have a community theater, if you don't know that, and um, it's just down Hawthorne Street right here, and it's fantastic, and it plays shows year-round, but if you've ever been to our theater, it's been folding chairs, and um, it's a wonderful, fabulous show, but they have been fundraising since their existence, since the time they were running it out of the community center with a makeshift stage and then in COVID when they couldn't have theater doing radio theater which is such a throwback and so cool um the radio flyers theater program on the radio and then they bought a theater and have we have a small town performing arts center here and they have gotten theater seats <clears throat> So it's such a big deal for this little town. These theater seats, they're legit, comfortable, cushioned, permanently installed theater seats. It makes the theater safer because of the exit aisles and um, the fact the seats flip up so you have more room between aisles to get in and out. It's a safety concern, but it's also a comfort thing. And I'm just am so incredibly proud of the Clinton Beach Playhouse um, for achieving that goal that they've been working so hard for. So I just want to show you. All right, that's all I have. Natasha, are you ready for our town manager update? So my town manager update consists of the uh, public safety first quarter report, uh, followed by finances third quarter report, and thirdly, we will have um, <coughs> in voted. Madam Mayor and members of council, um, please announce the first quarter uh, quarterly update for uh, 2024. <coughs> the, I think you have to back a couple slides. Is that okay? Let's straight into that. Okay. Um, so we had uh, for the police department in the first quarter, uh, we had a total of calls for service of 3,357. Uh, which is uh, calls for service and includes uh, self-initiated activity. Um, uh, out of those calls, we took 121 reports, made 523 traffic stops, 
uh, investigated eight accidents and uh, made 83 arrests. Uh, next slide, please. All right, that is a little bit hard to see, but um, this is for the offenses, uh, which means the, the things that we're taking reports for. Uh, the main, uh, or the, the largest numbers are going to be for assault, uh, destruction of property, as well, this is moving uh, left to right, uh, weapons, driving along the influence, and then uh, it's all other offenses is the last one. That's what's uh, most populated. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows our arrests. Um, again, the, the uh, bigger numbers were for aggravated assault, assault, uh, simple assault, uh, weapons violations, DUI, and then uh, the last one on the far, on the far right there is, um, uh, is a, uh, all other offenses. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this shows our offense trends um, and shows when the, the uh, largest <laughs> volume of uh, calls and, and uh, offenses that we have. You can see that obviously the weekend those picks up, so Thursday through Saturday, and it drops a little off on, on uh, Sunday. So that's what we try to staff our bigger numbers during those, those periods to, uh, to combat that. Next, thing, thank you. Um, this shows the, the offense trends per hour, um, and starting on the left, uh, that the spike there is about at uh, midnight. The next uh, uh, significant spike is about uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, the third is at about 5 o'clock, and then uh, the last significant spike there is at about 10 o'clock. Uh, so you can kind of see where the uh, where our offense times are. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide shows the uh, traffic enforcement citations that our officers are, are uh, issuing. Um, the, the largest that I'd be working from right to left on this one, uh, the largest um, bar, on the bar graph there is the uh, uh, basically speeding. Uh, the second one, the uh, next one to the left, is failure to obey signs, which could be running a stop sign um, or uh, not obeying any kind of uh, uh, regulatory sign. Uh, the next one is uh, not having the, a valid state inspection. Um, the, the next one would be a failure to stop, which would be to uh, or yield, like you have to yield to some, some other traffic. And then the last would be an expired uh, state tags. And then they would cut down from there. Next slide. Um, so we move into the quarterly report. This is for the, the uh, volunteer fire company. For the first quarter, they answered a total of 160 calls, uh, 59 of which were fire calls, 21 were for motor vehicle accidents, uh, 60 for the emergency uh, medical, 20 for public service. Uh, they, they served a total of 471.01 man hours, so a significant amount of, of uh, volunteer time. Um, and they, they averaged almost about four and a half uh, people or, or uh, Firemen per, per, uh, per call. Next slide. This is going to be for the uh, volunteer uh, rescue squad. Uh, they answered a total. Uh, that's a little bit hard to see. I apologize, but they answered a total of 22 medical calls. Uh, they uh, were on duty approximately 249 hours. They answered. Um, they, they had in January. They had nine total calls for transport. February seven and March 6 total calls for transport. Uh, their average response time uh, throughout the uh, uh, quarter was was four minutes. Uh, they, and also, they, uh, they're still not uh, running what they call a response unit, which is a one-person unit. So the transport unit is a uh, volunteer unit. And that's all I have. Oh, any questions for the G? Okay, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. 
Uh, you would be representing the third quarter fiscal year report for finance. Get a next slide, please. Uh, this is our general fund, our revenue and expenditures. In the middle there, you see the third quarter expenses. Uh, revenues at one million and expenses at two point four. Um, on the right, you'll see the year-to-date numbers. On the left is the budgets. Um, we are within our range. Uh, a lot of our revenue comes in at June for real estate taxes. Um, roughly about two point one million is anticipated uh, in the fourth quarter. The next slide shows the breakdown of where the revenue comes from and where the expenditures are being expended. I see this quarter um, property taxes and local taxes were where we got most of our revenue. And you'll see on the right uh, public safety, public works, and education are three top expenditures. We move over to the sewer fund. Um, same kind of chart in the middle shows the expenditures of revenue for the third quarter. And on the right is their year to date. And the left is our budget. We still have one more quarter of uh, sewer billing um, to collect in the fourth quarter. And again, the breakdown, where the money's coming from, where it's being spent. Um, the treatment plan, as you can see, has been our biggest expenditure item this quarter, uh, $632,000. Moving on to the water fund. Uh, our revenue expenditures uh, for the third quarter, um, we have an uh, increase in revenue. And yes, um, that's partly for our new um, fees that we have, um, anticipate, uh, have enacted for um, water connections and availability. And our expenditures include uh, $367,000 of, uh, of debt service. Um, as you can see, the water uh, revenue and expenditure breakdowns, mostly we get our water charges. And moving on to our disbursements. Our accounts payable total for the third quarter was $2.3 million. And our payroll was $631,000 with associated payroll tax on top of that of close to $230,000. Here's a brief update on ARPA. Um, you see the total funds that were received, what we've expended in 2000. 22 and 23. So far, our expenditures in 2024, that is in the CDA project for the most part. What the remaining budget that we have for 2024 and we're proposing in our 25 budget. And we saw our remaining balance already on final invoices from Dewberry and Sagres on the central drainage area. Are there any questions? Mr. Williams? Any questions? Um, the ARP funds uh, we're, we're paying, we're going to take some of the DEQ money and pay back um, the Central Drainage Project. Does that, that get roll, rolled back into the ARPA money? Yes, or is that, that is the intention. Um, the DEQ, we're working on, I guess, getting the, the first submission um, for that. I think that's we don't not even probably. In the first quarter of fiscal 25. Okay. And then also, you said something about the sewer connection fees. Does that go into the general water sewer budget or are they set aside for capital improvements? Uh, they go into the general budget. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Is it voted up next? Yes. Mona? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so 
we provide a utility report monthly and this i usually would come up here and just do a, a summary of the report uh this month we're going to go ahead and go through it with a little more detail so you understand what you see if uh, you would back that up to the opening introduction there you go so what this report consists of is your facility performance your compliance where we were um, we would also in the future we'll be adding equipment issues you know if we were to put all of the equipment failures in this report that we currently have it would be a lengthy report so moving forward what we will do is start adding to it um, the, the things that we have have failed during that month and what was done to resolve that so you know you will see your flow report in here you will see your analytical data as far and as well as what was reported to DEQ what I am happy to you know let you know is we had no exceedances for the month of March and if, in the event that we do have an exceedance we are required to provide a letter of explanation to DEQ with the EDMR which is the monitoring report that we provide them we will also include those letters in this packet for you all to review if there are exceedances so you know one thing if you scroll down there just a little bit to show the graph and one thing i will point out to you this is your your month or your average daily flows for march this is actually the daily flow so if you you see the spikes and flow there that is the amount of rain events that we had in the month of march and it also shows the severity of your eye and eye problem and you know notice there you know between the the 23rd you know you have four and a half million gallons of flow going through that facility when it is engineered for two million and permitted for two million gallons of flow so you know that is a significant impact on treatment as far you know it really impacts everything that happens in that facility so this this was a, a good bit of you know i and i a good bit of rain events that we had in march and what you will see in the next page is march has had the highest average flow than what you had any any month in the prior year so uh next page please and what you see here is what i was just speaking of this is your average daily flow month to month so if you go back and look at april of last year you know your average would have been 792 or uh, 792,000 gallons you know march we were averaging 1.7 million gallons per day and that's that's significant and below that you know you have your operational notes of the things that we did in the facility to improve treatment to make it more efficient to make some of the, the repairs the necessary to get where we are so with not having any exceedances for march and march being the highest average flow month you had for the entire year that's that's a that's a pretty significant change in what you guys are used to so normally i believe that you would have had a, a you, you have potential for overflows. You, you could have had solids discharge. We had none of that. You know, we managed the plant very well during month, during March with those increase in flow levels. And I'm not going to go through all of the operational notes, but you see here, there, there was a lot of different things done, you know, that they got us to where we are. Uh, next page, please. This is where you start getting in to show your, your analytical data, your when we take samples of the effluent, this is what we're sending out to the bay. And you see there your effluent quality. It gives you a, a list of how many samples we take, what days, you know, it's five days a week for most of your samples. Your TSS is only recorded one time a month. That is your total suspended solids going out of the, the effluent. So your BOD5, you know, we were well below our limit there. But one thing I want you to notice as we go through these graphs, if you go back up and look at the flow for March and then go down and look at the sample results, you will see how the sample results trend upward with the flow. So the days that we have high flow coming through the facility, the actions that we have to take does increase, you know, well, it doesn't hit a treatment. One of the things that we do during high flow is we have to turn off our air blowers, which provides dissolved oxygen for the biological treatment process. When we turn off those blowers, your biological, your, your bacteria does not get the oxygen that it needs to properly treat. But that is the only way that we can, you know, retain solids in the facility and not have a discharge. So as we scroll down through here, take, take a look at how that corresponds with your flow. Next page, or scroll down, please. Could you explain what that solid, that straight line is at the top, just showing that we're still way under 
yeah, that straight line is letting you know where your your average uh, permit or what, what you're permitted to, to discharge. So what you're looking for, obviously, is the majority of those sample results to be under that line as an average. Um, so, of course, BOD5 ammonia, you know, if you look at your ammonia there, you can see that it increases as the flow increases. And that's because of the inhibition and, you know, the, the lack of nitrific or de or nitrification as we turn off those blowers. You know, also, too, the, the sample results starting on the 11th would be the first samples collected after we took over the facility. And on your next page, you'll start to see the effect of the, the disinfection. So your fecal coliform and your intercocci, that's the level of disinfection that you had. That's how well that we're disinfecting this water before it goes into the bay. And you can see that after, after the 11th, that drops significantly. So during the, the months of December, January, and February, a lot of those results for anacocci and fecal coliform were significantly higher than what they are now. So there, that alone right there shows you the impact that we've had on the quality of water leaving the facility. And I'll scroll down a little bit, please. You know, that graph there shows it very well. You know, the, the fecal coliform on the seventh, you know, that's 20,000, that, that's a lot. You know, that's that's really, you, you don't want to see that leaving the facility. And we've made the necessary changes to, to prevent that. Scroll down, please. This is your um, total phosphorus, and below that is nitrogen. You know, that goes back. That is not your permitted exceedance or uh, permitted levels. That is what comes from what you call your WQIF grant money that you received. So this is a yearly average that you have to meet here instead of a monthly average. And you can see that we did have, you know, one day that was, was quite higher than the rest, but that is also due to your increased flow from the I&I. Down, please. Nitrogen as well. Um, nitrogen, you know, the removal comes from the denitrification process. You, in order to denitrify, we have to return a lot of the flow into an anoxic tank which puts the, uh, the bacteria in a anoxic state that turns the, um, the nitrogen into gas and it releases it. When we have to increase the flow going through the facility, we're not able to return that back to that anoxic zone in order to denitrify. So having to send the flow through the facility as fast as what we do really inhibits our ability to remove nitrogen. You know, now, by the time the year is over with, we do expect to be able to get that down within those permitted levels because it is a year-to-date average. But I think it's important for you all to understand how this I and I really does impact this facility and how important it is to get it fixed. Uh, scroll down, please. This is just a, a glossary of your terms, things that you will see there. It explains to you the abbreviations of the samples that we collect and what that means. You know, feel free to look those up to try to get a better understanding of, of how you know, the treatment removes those type of things. And that really summarizes the report. Um, we will, this, this will be fluid. We will add more uh, information to this as time goes on. That way you can get a real look of what's happening inside the facility and gives you the opportunity to, to be more engaged with it. And if anybody has any questions, I would be I'll glad to answer. Would this report be available on our website? That would be up to you. Yeah. Yes. Heather, do you have a call from it? Fantastic. I saw both hands go up and go to Dr. Sussell. So if you could scroll back to the increase in I and I, it was a year's worth of data, I believe. Correct. And I know we had very heavy rains last year at this time. And the thing that scares <laughs> me is that the only change is that we redid all that central drainage area, which was supposed to reduce I and I and we've got some significant increases. And do you have any recommendations on how we figure out where that's coming from? I would like to see the reports from the INI study that's been completed so far, and I would be able to, to give you a little more information on what I, how, you know, how I would proceed from there. I'd have to see that data. Can we share that data with them both? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. it's on the website too. I think I sent the links to all the council members. Remember, David, you asked for it, and I sent it back to Yeah. 
I'll, be, I'll get with Chris tomorrow and get that. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, that's really I'll kind of the, I mean, we were we were hoping that all of the central drainage area was going to reduce their R and I, and you know, this project was was started and finished during that year, and it looks like it's actually going up. So. And this doesn't necessarily mean that that was not effective because we have had an unusual amount of rain this month. That's so compared to last year. You think, think last year was more rain here? I think there well, was just as much last year. Yeah, you yeah. see it right there. There's no way to deny that. Yeah, so I would definitely take a look at that. And, and if there's anything I believe that we can do to, to make some fixes quickly, we'll, we'll discuss that with Chris and Natasha as well. Mr. By the way, I want to thank you for the tour of the plant uh, the other day. I uh, found it exceedingly uh, useful and uh, the rest of the council members I think you're inviting them to come take a tour of the plant as well. Oh, yeah, the, the graphs are nice but where the rubber really hits the road is results and I know that most of us were terrified with the amount of rain that we had that there was going to be a breach at the plant. Let me ask you in your professional opinion if we had been doing the same things that we were doing at this time last year what are the odds that there would have been a spill or an overflow there? You, I believe you would have certainly had an unusual discharge, and that meant that you probably would have had a loss of solids going out to the bay with the, with the practices being followed previously. The thing that I found striking is the number of things that you've been able to improve immediately have been the maintenance. And I wish you would address the vegetation that we all saw, everybody. We saw these tanks that looked like the Christmas tree farm sitting in those. Those are all gone. You didn't go in there with a five-gallon bucket and pull all that stuff out, did you? No, we just utilized the equipment that's in place. It's not functioning as it should, but it's functioning well enough to be able to, to prevent that buildup. You know, there is a little bit of vegetation still left, and that will require us to remove that manually. And the only reason we haven't beat it up and sent it to the plant is because it will clog up pumps and cause bigger problems. But it's, I'd say it's probably reduced by 80%. Would you agree? It's, it's striking the amount that it has been reduced. And then finally, I wanted to ask Chris, um, who is our acting director of public works. Chris is not an employee of Bowdoin. He's an employee of the town. He's been with the town for 13 years, so he doesn't have a dog in the hunt, as it were. Chris, what improvements have you seen at the plant? And do you have a good working relationship with Public Works and in Bowdoin? I think Public Works and Bowdoin has a great working relationship. The biggest improvement that I've seen is the water is going out of the plant, almost looking like drinking water. We'll drink it, but it looks like drinking water. So that's the biggest improvement. The treatment's better, and it's going out of the plant's cleaner, the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Um, you're going to be here for the budget meeting with Davenport. When is that? Um, so I think the public hearing will be at the regular May meeting, but you're coming to every, are you coming to every regular meeting? I won't be at every meeting, but I will be here when you need me to be. Okay. If not me, there will be some representative from our company here. Maybe you know, the project manager, if not myself. So that will be the third Wednesday of May. May I will be here for that meeting. Yes. Thank you. Yes, May 15th. Yeah, I think that would be good. That's when we'll hold a public hearing for rate setting, which is going to reflect some of the costs of operations. I will be plan. That. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and are there any other questions? Yeah. I just did a quick uh, search. I was just kind of curious. Um, it looks like our rainfall for our zip code is significantly higher this March than last March. So even though we have the rainy spring season, it looks like our rain was significantly higher for this year. Just again, just to kind of out there so thank you i know we were all sweating bullets the past end of march yeah i had rain washing across the road like a river this march and i had not seen that before yeah the, the, the ground at the plant we you can't even walk across and keep your boots dry it, it's it was a lot all right any other questions oh yes Mr. Williams. Well, i just wanted to mention uh i went back and referenced the uh, study that the mayor had mentioned I even I've heard you say it looks like some low hanging fruit, basically things that we could tackle easily and quickly. So 
My concern is how long should we keep waiting? If, can we start? When I was public works liaison, Rob Murphy said, we're getting ready to do smoke testing. Here we are two years later, we've done no smoke testing. If we were ready to do it then, why can't we do it now? Chris, do you know? Or? I know it's not an important question, but since we're talking about inflow and all that and the serious nature of it, I'm just curious. I want to let Chris respond. So that's part of what we're doing, deep working with DEQ at the moment to get this process to get forward. So that'll be coming up in the hopefully the next coming months to get the smoke testing and the heating of the system for the five drain basins that we very identified. And public works, when we do find INI issues, we repair them as we find them as well as we're doing repairs or installations for the normal. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sosal. Um, I believe, and I, forgive me if I'm mistaken, because this is just from memory, but didn't we talk about that smoke testing not being the best use of it? Did we, do you remember that conversation? Was the, I believe that was a hydrology study that we said that maybe wasn't okay. really the thing to do now, but smoke testing I encourage, cameraing okay. of the lines I encourage, okay. and that's something I would start just as soon as you can get the equipment to do so. And that and a smoke test would identify not only where there's I and I issues, but also people that are illegally draining into the system. Right? Absolutely. You know, you'll have smoke coming out of their gutters, you'll have smoke coming out of their yards. And it gives you also, you know, you can identify whether your I and I is on your system or whether it's on the citizen system. So, you know, some of the things when you do the smoke test, you identify, you put flags in the ground where the smoke is coming out. And if that smoke is on the customer side, then they would be responsible for that repair. And if the flag is on the town side, then the town's responsible for that repair. So that's a very good method to, to start with. And do we have authority to force property owners to fix those issues? Just looking at the lawyer. <laughs> hey, hey, I hate to answer it, uh, but I would fix that's their responsibility to some of the problems they're going into the system. So. Was there an update from like what the next steps are? I mean, I, to David's point, there's no, there's nothing in the way of going to the next step, right? I mean, my understanding is there's there's money, there's, there's will, nothing, there's... There's, no, there's nothing stopping you. From okay, so where that is the plan, right? I mean, I don't I think really what would stop you at this point is having the equipment to do the smoke testing, whether you do it in-house or you hire a contractor to do it. You know, it does require a blower and, and some other things to do that with. And a camera, you know, I'm pretty sure that the town doesn't have its own camera system. I think we were going to contract it out, which is fine. I mean, we have the funding to do it. Let's get it done kind of deal. We can discuss that tomorrow. Me and Chris will sit down and go over that. Okay, any other questions? All right, I think, thank you. Oh, can I come for a tour Friday? Any yeah. other council members want to come for a tour on Friday? Yeah, sure. What time would you like to come? Oh, okay. What time? Maybe noon. Noon? Noon will work. Oh, not noon. 11. 11 is even better. All right. You don't have any problems with hikes. <laughs> That's all I said. I, I've been up there before. Oh, uh, okay. Well, it won't be my first time. I'll be looking forward to it. And if anybody else wants to come, just let me know and we can work out the schedule and make it happen. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Oh, <laughs> was that Karen? Krista, I thought I was going to get it. I'm sorry, the rave happening on my left side was distracting. So we're supposed to all have our walk on music. Okay, next up. Mr. Trivet, looking forward to it, and I see you brought a friend. 
Sure. Let's see, so I'm getting more comfortable doing it. Sorry. Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I think the county administrator started to like it down here. Maybe we can find him a house. Oh. <laughs> um, I was going to refer him to a realtor, but um, anyway, I'll let him come a few more meetings before he decides. Uh, but I'm very glad to see him tonight, and I'm sure that he'll be glad to answer any questions that uh, you may have. He's been true to his word about showing up whenever he can, and this is either the second or third time, at least, that he's been here. And I'm, I'm glad to see that. And, and the other thing I'm glad to see is he's taken us through a budget process that's been, you know, unbelievable. Uh, when I came on this board, you know, over four years ago, uh, you know, when you walked in the meeting, you were given a, a – Two or three hundred page document and and that was it and you know you voted on it and he has met with each individual supervisor um went through it extensively um he's met with every constitutional officer and and director and the board has done that as well and he's still having meetings with us again this week to ensure that we fully understand um how difficult this year's budget is going to be and just listen to y'all I like to trade budgets with you because the, the one we have is, is uh, you know, but, but that's what happens when you um, don't know what's going on for so many years and then all of a sudden it's thrown on you. And so we'll see how it plays out, but it's, it's not very comforting. And I'll just have to tell you that um, I wanted to let you know that James Monroe's uh, birthplace celebration is this Saturday. Thank you. Um, 1030, I think is the time. And uh, it's usually well attended. Uh, and so if you get an opportunity to go to that, and I think I heard Ms. Brown say that dinner was this week, but I think it's actually the 27th. It is the 27th. Um, all the local fire departments are going to be doing that uh, as a result of Earth Day. Uh, uh, the third district supervisor, Matt Ingram, has agreed to come down here, but we're going to do from the beach gate, which is going to be uh, – quite an effort to towards Hall store, which I know Mary, you've advocated for doing that many years and, and every year, even in June, when you do your, your uh, trash cleanup day down here, uh, but it's gotten terrible. So we're going to do that. And I don't, anybody that wants to volunteer, um, you know, is more than welcome, but that's what we're going to try to do is, is from the beach gate heading out to Ward Hall store, but it's a lot of, is a lot of trash. So I don't know how far we'll get or, or we'll probably run out of bags if I had to bet. Um, but anyway, that is on the 27th and there'll be an initial meeting at eight o'clock down at, at the uh, county building uh, to kick it off. Um, and then everybody will go to, it's, it's all over the county uh, where this is gonna be undertaken. So, um, and, and I just was thinking, you know, when y'all talking about the radio station, this would be a good gentleman to get on porch talk. Uh, so he could, uh, it's impressive, and, and you need to be commended uh, for for taking this disaster and turning it into a positive thing. And I'm just speaking as a citizen when I say that because I came to your meetings and we heard the good, bad, and ugly. But you definitely need to be commended that you have stepped up to the plate and, uh, and done the right thing. And, I mean, just to hear this and see this, I, I wish every citizen in this town was here to hear it and, and see what's happened so quickly when you hire people that are professional that know what they're doing. Uh, and, and definitely this is impressive to see this turn around and I commend public works and, um, and this gentleman and his company uh, for, for changing that around. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention tonight um, was that uh, obviously, you know, I've stood here in front of you for the last, at least since April of 22. And we've had conversations about EMS and about 24-7, uh, you know, first responders in this town. And we knew after the April 22nd meeting that uh, it was going to be difficult for the volunteer rescue squad. And it's been extremely difficult for them. And I hope that you will honor one day those heroes, uh, Chief Holden, uh, Olive, and, uh, and Tammy Preston, who is the chief and, and uh an assistant chief, uh, they've led the operations for the last two years, and it has been a struggle. It, and they work full time in first responder care in other counties, and then get off and come down here and try to make those 85 hours. And those 85 hours don't sound like much for a month, but if they saved one life, it's a lot. 
and and you know they put in the hours that they could put in and and uh and and i can't commend them enough for for the job they have done uh i have to say that uh uh, and I'm sure that the county administrator can confirm this. Uh, the mayor and I have collaborated for the last two years multiple times about what are we going to do to change this and work together as a team to make this happen. And, and the one conclusion that we knew was the fact that we were going to have to wait till we got a new administrator. Um, and, but believe me, the very first meeting that I had with this county administrator was about EMS and about correcting something that's been wrong for the last couple of years. And he was very receptive to that. He totally understood that. All he had to do was look at the numbers. For the last year uh, of the 950 calls that has been run in this district, over 500 of them have been right in this town. Uh, I could tell you on and on how many times all four squads have been in this town in one day, sometimes at the same time. So we know how critical it is uh, and what a need it's been. Um, so we, uh, we collaborated, we've, we've met, uh, the, the, I sat down with the county administrator and the chief of EMS, uh, um, Mr. Bird, and we brought the mayor into that conversation and, and um, council member uh, Krista Brown and our second district supervisor who who agreed on uh, Jeff McCormick to be a part of that team, as well as uh, the rescue squad people. We, we knew that it was imperative that it be confidential initially, because we know what Facebook does to us. You know, we hear it every month and we see it every month. Um, you know, you, you hear about the ugly, but you don't hear about the good. And, and, you know, a lot of times the good is turned into the ugly, which it shouldn't be, but it's just like, so I accept that. And I guess we all accept it, even though we don't want to accept it, but, we were able to keep that uh, very confidential until we could bring the squad on board to determine whether they wanted to participate or not. Um, and they were 100% behind it. However, they had to take it to their board of directors as well. So we obviously didn't want anything out there uh, on the street that would have, you know, uh, put a wrench in that. And, and so I think we all that, that participated in those conversations and those meetings did a good job of just keeping it where it needed to be until so we could come to you and let you know and let the public know. And then we did a joint press release, which was very minimal, but it was to the point basically letting everybody know that we're not trying to shut down the Columbia Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad like happened in 2022. And, you know, maybe all of you were there at that meeting when there was three or 400 people there. And it, it, it was a real possibility that was going to happen. Uh, but it didn't, you know, we had the numbers in the power that night and, and, and the people that, that wanted to, to, to make that happen back down from it. And I'm, I'm happy to say that, that at our meeting, uh, we discussed it at our work session in March and we just discussed it at our meeting in April. Um, and it was unanimous that this was needed in this town, which, you know, we could have saved, you know, probably over half a million dollars in infrastructure by adding on to that building at Oak Grove. But I, I'm one of those kind of people that say, you know, you can't change the past. So we're going to put it behind us and we're looking to the future. Um, I just wanted to briefly tell you uh, what's going on from this point moving forward. Uh, we hope to have a meeting in the first week of May with the town council or whoever wishes to be there from the town so that we can discuss anything they want to ask and they can hear firsthand about how this is going to occur and how it's going to benefit them. And that's the blessing because it's going to benefit all of us. I think the average response time in the county is like 12 minutes. Just think what that's going to reduce in this town. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be very minimal. Um, even as I think you saw on the charter, uh, what the chief might have said about four minutes response time or something like that. You know, that is unbelievable. That's a goal that, that you know, you want to see. Uh, the, the only problem with that is, I tell you, these squads stay at the Dagon Hospital constantly. And we all know that you're talking about two or three hours from the time they get that call to the time they pick that patient up to the time they drop them off the hospital and they get back here. And it's, it's even longer now in some circumstances because anybody that's been to the hospital lately knows they're even setting up a triage in the waiting room because they've got so many patients that they can't 
they, they just can't see them all. So sometimes those squad members have to stay with that patient until they can do that formal turnover. And sometimes it's, it's a considerable amount of time. So we know our budget this year is going to be close to $5 million for EMS. And, you know, uh, so we know that uh, what the need is. We also know that we have more call volume than anybody in the whole region. So, you know, we're, we're, we're working at that. Uh, we're staying on top of it. Uh, hopefully Chief Bird, when he comes, will also talk about something that he presented to the board uh, about hiring an advanced practitioner. Uh, we've had a mobile unit that we got a grant for that was almost 500000 a couple years ago, and that mobile unit has been unbelievable. It's just man with one person, but what happens is, and we have it in this town, because I see it all the time where you have some patients who call and call and call and you're at their house, you know, four or five or more times a week, sometimes a day. And so that that person that, that drives that mobile unit is a medic who can go and basically see what their problem is, if they can help them versus because the county gets nothing if that squad comes from Montrose or comes from Oak Grove and doesn't transport the only time you get reimbursed is if you transport. So if we go to this practitioner program, we'll be able to down the road charge Medicare, Medicaid, or, or insurance companies when they provide that service. Because it'll be just like when you go to the doctor and you have a physician, practitioner, whatever, you know, they can prescribe medications or do whatever else, and then we can bill that uh, to pay for that position. So initially the county will fund it if it's approved in the budget, and then it will it will actually start funding itself after the first couple of years. So it's something that's, that's needed because we all know how far it is to get treatment and how overwhelmed these doctors are and how weeks and weeks sometimes before you can get an appointment. So we're hoping to do everything we can. And, and Chief Bird has been very innovative. He's been going out there trying to find out what can we do to reduce times to, to, to help people more quickly and, and more efficiently and, and save money. So uh, I commend him for that. And, uh, but I just wanted to, to just briefly tell you um, uh, just a couple things that's been discussed between the squad and the county and the town officials. Um, uh, they're doing some facilities uh, alterations to, to house the EMS people 24 seven. We hope to have that on board sometime in May uh, where they'll be here providing that service. But the, what's going to be the good thing about it is the squad is going to incorporate into the county. They will still be volunteers, but their operational side will run as, as West Mullen County EMS because that's what the law requires. Um, the squad will have West Mullen County on the side of it, but it's not going to affect the uh, 501c3. And that will still exist with the volunteer rescue squad. So down the road, hopefully this is a temporary fix. Um, to get them here and to, and to be in that building. And, and for some of you, you probably recall uh, when the county first took over EMS, they were in that building down there for about seven years. So it's not going to be anything new, but obviously it has to be a facility that's going to accommodate them. Uh, but it will greatly reduce the times from a squad come from Montrose. What's been the, the practice in the last couple of years is, and it's, it's crazy. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen and, and that, if a squad comes here, the other squad goes to the middle and goes to Montrose. And then they're winding up right back here because the majority of the calls are right in this town. So now we'll have a full-time squad here. We'll have one at Oak Grove and hopefully that one will stay there that can go either direction. If they need to go down the county, they can go that way. So it should be a, a, a decrease in mileage and, and funding uh, to be able to do that. Um, so the facilities is the first thing. Uh, uh, the squad no longer will be required to do that 85 hours. So, uh, but they'll be a part of, of West Mullen County. And we all know, yeah, I mean, y'all were at that meeting, many of you, whenever the county administrator said, hey, we'll give it all to you. Remember that? You know, remember the cost that he, he was more than glad to give it to you, knowing what the cost is, even though he knew full well that he was required to provide it. Um, so, so we're looking good to the, uh, looking, looking at these things as, as good changes, uh, that are going to come, uh, and, and, you know, in, in April and May, um, these things are going to start aligning. Um, but I, I tell you, I just can't thank those that have been involved in this process enough. 
it's going to greatly benefit our citizens, no doubt, in the 5th District, as well as the 4th District. You know, uh, the, the, those response times mean everything. And, and we know, we've seen the police department on numerous occasions providing CPR uh, while it took a squad to get there, you know, 15, 20 minutes because they might have been, you know, in Montrose or wherever. And it's not their fault. It's just how it worked out, um, how things are. So, uh, but, but we're thankful. We have the fire department here that responds to those incidents when they're life critical. The police department responds every time. They're well trained and they don't set back and and call on the radio and wait for somebody to get there. They they react and they provide first aid as well when they get there, which has been a great thing for our town when that occurs. Um, but I'm glad to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Chief Bird will come down and he'll, there's no sense in me going through all these slides and everything that he's gonna present. Uh, but I did wanna give you an update because it, it is a positive thing and I think we've went about it the right way. Uh, to ensure that that we're all going to greatly benefit from it. So, but I, I have to thank all of you too that have been there. There's not a one of you that hasn't been there to support this happening at some point or another. And just you know, some may have put in more time because we knew we had to to keep this ball rolling. Because sometimes you just think about things and you know, and talk about them, and they never never happen to a long ways down the road. But we've never let this off the front burner since April of 22. And so we're where we need to be. And, and hopefully, you know, and I see in the future, the very near future, you know, we're going to be really looking seriously at fire departments. The volunteers are hard to get and hard to retain. The training is unbelievable. And all the new regulations that are coming out is just unbelievable. So I'm going to stop there. I just want to follow up. We had um, a discussion after the meeting with um, Chief uh, Bird and Chief Holden to invite them, and I wanted to bring that to council here. Um, they are available at the next work session date, uh, May 1st, at from 6 to 7, because the rescue squad, the volunteer squad, has their regular meeting at 7, but the first hour, um, they are, their schedules allow them to be available to do a special part of our meeting, which would be in joint with this to provide more information. So I just wanted to Float that idea to council and see if that was, um, if, you know, if everybody was on board with doing that, designating that 6 to 7 p.m. time frame of the next work session. I know we have a lot of budget stuff too and a lot of other things on the agenda, but it's hard to get all of these entities sometimes in the same room and it's already a public notice time frame. And we'd like, um, so how's that sound? I would make that motion. Okay. Second. Okay. Is there, I think it's important for our citizens to be able to hear it firsthand, and this would be, you know, to make sure that they're invited and are made aware of, you know, their, their, what they're going to do that night to tell us about it. Yeah, I think it, the idea is to invite the Board of Supervisors, um, the County Administrator, and the both entities to be here to answer questions and um, just to have the opportunity to bring it closer to home because we all know Montrose is quite some place and um, not always do our citizens go uh, to hear all that information. And I think both Chief Bird from Westmoreland and Chief Holden from the Rescue Squad, the presentations that we were privy to were fantastically done and I think, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Council and self self I think it's an awesome idea. I've not seen any opposition or take a vote on that motion. All in favor? Uh, any votes? Okay, great. So we'll set that for May 1st from 6 to 7. And um, please let the uh, other supervisors know to uh, please attend or welcome to attend if they would so like to. And um, can, Bird. We, can we send a form one invitation? Absolutely. Yeah, Heather, you can you send them a formal invitation? Yeah. Fantastic. I yeah, have a question on others. others. All right, hold well, on. I'm going to go to Mr. Wood then first. Mr. Trivet, uh, Mr. Prescott, uh, our team here, uh, Council Person Brown, Mayor Schick, uh, thank you for your leadership. And that's it's a tremendous thing you brought to to our area. Uh, the other thing is, I, Mr. Trivet, I want to thank you for the plug. We do have a bug coming on for an interview uh, again on May 9th and uh, May 11th. 
And we're even going to have uh, Mr. Prescott join us sometime in May. Is that still good for you, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're looking forward to that. But you're, you're a great uh, program director. So uh, if you want to volunteer, please feel free to do so. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, here's so sure, going back to the beginning of your report, um, I understand that Green Space is, doing, is coordinating with the county cleanup for Earth Day so that Green Space will be doing something here in town while you guys are working. For the road, is that correct? That's On right, your right. space, the nonprofit. Yeah, I think there was um, maybe Ms. Tucker knows too because she spoke about it at the uh, at our meeting. I'm not yeah, sure who's going to coordinate it in the to town. Change because they were going to do it on a different date, and I think they agreed to change the oh, okay. date and do it in conjunction with the county wide. I, I could talk to that, Mr. Trim, if you like. Sure. All right. So first of all, I want to thank the the town of Colonial Beach and their uh, and your cleanup committees for agreeing to, to match with the counties. Uh, currently, uh, we are, uh, we're, we're, I'm finalizing the logistics behind it. So first of all, thank you for joining with our effort in our first county-wide Earth Day event. Um, uh, Mr. Trivet, Mr. Ingram, Mr. McCormick are all on board with helping keeping this county clean. So uh, I wanna thank you guys for coordinating with us. Because this is our first effort, we're not really good at it. We'll get better at it next year. I think it's going to be a, an annual effort. Uh, additionally, uh, one of the things that I have secured is I've got VDOT support. We've got vests. We've got uh, bags. And the county's picked up 80, you know, those you know, little stick things that clean up, right? So as part of the logistics of it, I want to talk to your committee to find out how many of these sticks that we can give out. We want to try to get them out to all groups. I would ask that we get them back because they're not inexpensive uh, and we purchased a couple thousand dollars worth of these sticks. So, um, you know, I'll get with your committees and we'll give 20 to you guys. So, and bags and vests so you guys can be protected and all that sort of good stuff. And we'll coordinate where everybody is working. Uh, that's the other effort that we're looking at. And don't forget that the, all of the VFDs have kind of opened their doors for a fundraising meal participation after afterwards. So we tried to do several things with one effort. Okay. Can I, I would, can I say a couple other things and I'll turn it back over to him? Oh, okay. All right. one, more, one more question while you're up there. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Prescott. Um, and this is kind of an insider um, comment, but I just want to tell you how glad I am to hear that you were able to deal with the complicated budget we have in West Mullen County. Sounds like you have stepped up and really understand what to do and are presenting it better to our representatives than had been done in the past. Thank you for that. I, I, I actually just did what the supervisors asked me to do. You know, the supervisor said that the budget process has been, and Mr. Trivet is probably one of the most outspoken of the supervisors, that said we need to see more. We just need to see more. And, um, and so we took that to heart. I took that to heart. Uh, the finance team and I did some extra effort to get to that point, and uh, we're going to continue to maintain that. I just don't believe in, you know, one person doing the budget and no input. So, you know, kudos to your supervisor that, you know, clearly articulated that to me, and, and he deserves uh, much of the credit for making sure that the process is done. I did the work. He gets the credit. That's the way it should be, right? So uh, we, but it was, it was a necessary thing. Uh, just a couple of quick other things. I do will be talking to your uh, to your uh, uh, contractor here from Emboden because our county does impact your system, and so we need to make sure that we're part of the uh, process on that. I definitely want to see the plan. Uh, my conversation with Mr. Wood last week, uh, he came down to uh, Westmoreland. He wanted to take me out to lunch. We didn't have time for it. I was pressed for other duties, but. He was graciously going to take me to Angelo's for lunch. No, no bribe work intended there. Trust me, it's just. <laughs> well, it <deserves> a <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we talked a lot of different things. Uh, we talked a lot of different things. So uh, there's a lot of things that are in the pike. With or it, you know, I see a lot of things happening. I've only been here four months, but I was happy to see that we were able to get the rescue squads together. I will tell you this: uh, I've given direction to Chief Bird to make sure it's communicated that Westmoreland expects 
We don't want, we expect your volunteers to remain in place and remain a partner with us. We don't want them to go away. We need them. We expect, that's an expectation of us more than your, your volunteer squad maintains its integrity and works, uh, works in conjunction with us because this is a pooled effort. <coughs> so he's gonna, he's coming down to talk real partnership. We're not just, this is not just what we say. We're gonna back up what we say with, with actual deeds. So um, that's just the start. Um, so there's lots of different ideas and I don't wanna step on Supervisor Trivet's uh, discussion points, but I did wanna get those out in case anybody has any questions or concerns. Any questions from your council that I can answer? Thank you. Okay, great. We still have a full presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Mr. Williams? Tim. Tim. One of the things I was going to ask, in, um, in my mind, when I heard about all this, I thought that this, you know, because the rescue squad was struggling a little bit. Um, to me, this seems like a, an incentive for people to start even donating more to the rescue squad building effort because now it will be even more of a benefit to the town because not only has volunteers, but also Westmoreland. Is that a are safe you, assumption to- are you, are you talking about for a new building? Yes. Yeah, and I'll tell you, and we all know because we read the newspaper and we were involved, there was something that put a damper on the, on the gifts that were coming in. It may have slowed that process down some, unfortunately. Um, but yes, that's something in collaboration that we've also talked about is, is a building and how the county, uh, last year we gave the uh, local squad uh, $60,000 right in that range uh, for their operational costs. So that money will be repurposed maybe towards a building or whatever else the needs are. Uh, something, you know, and they know it as well as we know it. You know, those new squads now are two years out if you have to order one. And they were 450,000 when we ordered two of them last year. So there'll be, you know, probably five or 600,000 by the time, you know, you start ordering another one. And I don't know what kind of mileage is on theirs. I know they told us, but uh, all of those squads and their equipment will be incorporated into the county as well to save costs. But yes, there will be some, you know, we hope to still see donations come in towards that building. And then the county hopefully will pay, play a role in that as well. And that's something that's going to be worked out at a lower level that, you know, where the, the people are, you know, have their tires on the road. It won't be at, at the at anything that I'll be involved in. It'll be involved in the involvement will be between the chiefs of the squads and, and um, you know, and the people that are doing the operations about what their needs are going to be. So uh, but we know costs have went up and that that building now is projected to cost probably around one point six million. And it's going to, you know, as we know, we've talked about costs in here earlier tonight, and it's it doesn't matter what it is. It's just everything has gone up so much, and you know, building materials aren't going to come down. So hopefully, you know, that will be something. That's a great question, and and, and we're going to work towards that goal of making that building happen. Um, and we'll still, the plan is still to recognize Coyne Beach Volunteer Rescue Squad, and if and if that building can have a floor on it that will house their their, you know their uh, volunteer organization, that, that will be the goal. I've seen that in other counties where that partnership has worked very well. And, and I think it will here just as well. It just takes, you know, people to work out the logistics and people to know what they're doing, you know, to be involved in it and make it happen. And, and I think that we're going to be a partner in all that as well and, and do what we can to, to see that that happens. I know you will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you. All right, next up, Point of Beach Public Schools, Dr. Mitchell. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Schick. Good evening, all town council members and everyone in the audience. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, Dr. Sal Sullivan already mentioned earlier that the board did approve uh, the budget uh, at the last board meeting. A um, couple of congratulations to a couple of staff members and students. I want to congratulate um, Dr. Uh, Tanya Ken, who is our high school uh, art teacher. Uh, he had three of his students uh, take first place at the Expressions of Tomorrow Art Show in Montrose. Uh, similarly, I want to congratulate Ms. Uh, Dana, our art teacher, 
uh, at the elementary school who also had three students who took first place for their work at the art competition in Montrose. Um, for the 24, 25 school year, um, we have uh, a huge number, 21 students who got accepted at the Love and Neck Technical Center. Uh, that is huge for us as a division. When I came here uh, about three years ago, um, we, three school years ago, we had about seven students at the Northern Neck Technical Center. And so to go from that to about 21 uh, is uh, truly amazing. I'm hoping that as we move on, we could hopefully get to close to 30 kids uh, at the Northern Neck Technical Center. Another piece of good news uh, for the 24, 25 school year, uh, we had three students. Typically, we get two a year, but this year we were able to get three students accepted to the Chesapeake Bay Governor School. Um, and uh, we typically have six slots. Uh, the, board of, the board asked me uh, if there was a way for us to look at petitioning for another slot beyond the six. Uh, I was able to do that, um, and we were able to get a third student who really is an outstanding, outstanding student, uh, you know, met the criteria, and will be starting governor's school. So we'll have seven students at the governor's school, and one of our current um, students at the governor's school, Chesapeake Bay uh, Center, uh, got accepted uh, to the video -E prestigious honor of uh, summer Governor School Residential Program. So that's huge for us as a division. It's been a long time since we have a student get accepted for the residential uh, summer program. I want to congratulate our elementary music teacher, Ms. Williams, and her students you heard earlier for really doing an outstanding job at the Osprey Festival. Uh, it was nice to see the kids out uh, singing, uh, and you know they did a wonderful job. I know they were super nervous, but uh, they had a great leader, and we were very thankful that they were able to participate at uh, the Osprey uh, Festival. A couple of big things for us, capital improvement. Um, I want to let the council know we were able to finish our high school HVAC project. Uh, that was about a $400,000 project. We were able to install 25 new units uh, at the high school. Uh, obviously, that was a big project for us, uh, and they haven't been replaced for over 20 years. So now our attention is going to be to hopefully move the um, contract in terms of maintenance, since we have the new ones here, to the elementary school and make sure we keep on having that because it's about six, seven years running. Uh, also, a uh, huge project, getting ready hopefully to uh, award that piece um, to hopefully one of our local contractors uh, to look at the uh, CIP project for redoing the concession stand. Um, we, um, well, uh, my team and I have worked with uh, Video E to sort of like um, also create an outdoor classroom in that area and renovate the bathrooms. And we will be able to use some of our SF funds, uh, got that approved um, last week, uh, to pay for part of that project. Not the entire project, but for part of it, uh, and make sure that we outfit that as an outdoor classroom. So the old area where we had the concession, the press box, will now be retrofitted to really have sort of like, I use the term veranda, some people say, uh, I'm going to use a veranda, that's the old term. So with a um, shelter outside so the teachers can go out there and you know, uh, meet with kids. We also are uh, knee deep in the um, renovation. I noticed everything is high school, high school, high school renovation. It's 20 something years old and we haven't done a whole lot to it. So the goal is to try to get some projects done. Uh, we um, signed the contract and in the process of the high school redesign for the front entrance and the security vestibule, as well as the multi-purpose room uh, with an outdoor uh, weight room for our athletes, as well as renovating our two science labs at the high school, which is pretty archaic. Um, you know, for those of you who've been in the area, they're pretty archaic, so we're hoping to get those renovations done. Um, we had the architectural and engineering firm come out and did interviews with staff about that project. It's my goal to hopefully do a community um, 
sort of like input uh, with uh, the architectural firm before we um, finalize all of the designs. Um, and we also in the process of doing phase three, again at the high school, uh, changing all of the old 20 plus year old lights to all LED. We have done phase one and phase two, and we are hoping to do phase three this summer. So those are some of the big things. Oh, I, I gotta say this one because this is a huge piece. Um, we also uh, are in the process, as you know, our high school does not have a generator. Elementary does. We are a FEMA designated emergency center at the high school and we don't have a generator if we lose power. So it creates a couple of problems for us um, on the food and services side when we lose power, we lose food. Uh, so what I've done with my team is to again work with the Virginia Department of Education uh, to really look at that project. While we were gonna fund it through our CIP, I was able to make a case to be able to fund this project uh, in the tune of $265,000 uh, with paid power services, uh, with a contract, uh, and we're gonna pay that from our some of our uh, funds through ESSA. So again, it's gonna cost the division zero dollars to put a brand new generator at the high school. Uh, and lastly, uh, in summary, I should say, um, uh, for the 2023-24 school year, which is this one, uh, we have completed 83%, which is 10 out of 12 of the projects outlined in our CIP. Uh, there's only two projects, not because we haven't worked on it, because it's very difficult to get a contractor to come here to do that type of work, because we're a little bit smaller. And looking ahead for the 24-25 school year, CIP, we already started four out of the seven projects uh, to include awarding um, three of those contracts uh, for the upcoming school year. So we are ahead of the game in terms of ensuring that uh, we completely modernize the district, particularly at our high school, uh, bring things up uh, to, uh, I don't want to say up to code because things are up to code, but we want to make sure that uh, we spruce the place up a little bit. And so we want to thank um, the town council uh, for their support over the years uh, with the uh, referendum to be able to put some funds in CIP to cover those projects. With that being said, that's all I have. Any questions for me? Any questions? Yes, Mr. Um, yes, you mentioned the budget was passed. Is that um, based on the numbers we see, saw earlier, or is there any new information from the, the state's budget? No new information. Uh, it is uh, the General Assembly. I put out their budget, so we build on that. There was some, uh, last week the governor had some um, amendments. I know the, they had their session yesterday. And I received an email, which I haven't opened yet, before I came here with some of the updates between the governor's <coughs> proposal and amendments um, to that budget. Um, I don't necessarily think it's gonna affect it that drastically because some of the things was really more around the implementation of lab school, some of the big projects the governor had in terms of implementation, and then also um, uh, giving uh, some giving parents a little bit more choice and some maybe some the old terminology for those of us who've been in education for a while in a voucher type process but they don't call it that so we're going to wait to see what happens uh, but it's my intention to delve through that email probably sometime tomorrow not today okay thank you you're welcome and maybe i've misheard a past meeting was there an effort to um i know you the one of the things that was concerning to students and staff was to redo the re do um, the the facade at the front of the high school? Yes. Is that is that still that is still that is part of the project that we are going to be doing with Ashley McGraw? It's really three That's three part parts. So the first part is the high school redesign front entrance, the maintenance building to include the outdoor weight room, uh, space for transportation, custodial, and then re redoing those two science rooms. So we're looking at a one contract, but doing multiple uh, projects within that contract. Great, thank yes. you, mm -hmm. excited about that. One additional thing um, is, for whatever reason, this town really likes to buy bricks. Yes. So if you incorporate that some way into some new facade of something, you know, okay. alumni maybe buying bricks with their names or family names or something, 
something, a walkway, anything like if you look at Tory Smith or the pier or anywhere else, you, you notice that people really like to buy their names on a brick. <laughs> um, so that could help you not recoup your costs, but at least provide some funds yeah. back into the school to help right. with other projects or clubs or something, yeah. right? I wrote that down. That's a, that's a good idea. I know I there were some previous projects in the past that I ran across some bricks and we were coming up with a plan to try to use that. So that's good to know. I understand. Yeah. Did you have something else? Yes, sir. Krista just made me think of. Um, have we figured out anything to address the safety, like the kids getting home, the walkways, and crosswalks, and all that stuff around the school? Is so that's a project that is still ongoing. It's a project that we're still having conversations about with, with the town. Um, the issue that exists that still exists, which is twofold. One is we want to make sure that we have those flashing lights that comes out of a certain time when we arrive and then when we leave, that's one piece we talked about. And the other piece is really the walkway because we have more kids walking now, particularly to our apartment complex uh, off of first street. So those are still things that we're discussing and trying to figure out a solution for that. Um, but yes, it's, it's still in conversation, but no solutions yet. Okay, thank you. Williams, that is definitely an important thing. I know that months back, I believe it was December, we met with a superintendent and a lot of it, I know that Dr. Uh, Sullivan was involved. Um, a lot of it was it's VDOT streets, and they've come out and done the study, wouldn't come out. So it is an ongoing thing, and it's something, thank you for bringing that up and to keep that current because it does need to be addressed. We did not forget about that, but it's been, a, it's been hard tracking down what past council uh, administrations have done and, and past yeah, chiefs. It was a traffic study that we, apparently we cannot find the traffic study that has the traffic counts. And I don't know why, so I asked um, our town manager to reach out to the people that we contracted with for that to see if we could give another copy of the traffic study um, that was done. I know they had um, things that could calculate the speed of the vehicles and also the number of traffic and the times which they were going. And I remember First Street being of concern when that was presented to us, but we still haven't been able to locate that study. Okay. Maybe with the extra 20000 we can buy some. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. I had these restrooms. <laughs> we were talking about the traffic issues, the like okay. concerns, safety concerns of kids getting home. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm frustrated. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we have done is a right of way study there for and, uh, Ms. Tucker and I have been discussing with that. And I think you and I were there that, that day. To, um, it is an ongoing process, as uh, you you and I have discussed, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, but uh, you know, we're we're looking into and looking into being the operative word, trying to yeah. make sure something can be done. Um, walkways being provided in that area, but um, it's something that we're in the nascent stages of. But at least there's progress toward. It. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the key thing is at least we have the ongoing conversations, and it's at the table, and that's all we're asking. I heard from a parent that the scheduling changes for the walk home kids has really improved the traffic situation. Yeah, it, it has helped. You know, you still have uh, some students who still don't yeah, follow sure. processes. Yeah. But yeah, that has. We have we have probably tried three separate strategies. I think the latest one has gotten a little bit better. But yes, we, we try to keep reinventing ideas to keep it safer for kids. But uh, it is uh, much better than before. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have one sign up, Mr. Law. <coughs> Public comment. Welcome you to the Joe and Nigel. State your name and address for the record. And your question. Nigel Long, 115 Lynnhaven Court. Um, I'll, I'll keep this brief for a reason I'll explain in a second. Um, I want to do Three things, maybe. Um, to congratulate you, Madam Mayor, and the, your council members uh, with the diligence with which you are reviewing our budget. I think it's, um, I had the pleasure of um, watching the last uh, town council meeting. I does have the advantage of being able to um, drink plenty uh, while you're watching it uh, when, you, when you're not here. Um, 
but it was very impressive how you're tackling every element of this. Um, and clearly, the second point is clearly it relies on all the employees of the town bringing you good information. And so hearing that you're going to do things towards um, uh, re uh, paying them in a way that they deserve and in a way that hopefully will bring more qualified employees into the town so that maybe Mr. Dooley doesn't have to have quite as many contractors working for him. Um, all those things, I think, are, are great to hear. I was going to talk at some depth about um, funding for the budget, but you um, uh, had a very interesting discussion a little while ago about that subject, about where money uh, can and should come from. I think it's very important that you we don't fall into any trap, as we did with the wastewater plant, of not accumulating sufficient funds to deal with all the surprises that come every month, every year, um, and over future years, so that you don't take short-term decisions, but look at the total picture. I think that's very in, important. Um, the one thing I would add to what Dr. Karen said is that should you now or at some time in the future decide that any, a small increase in personal prop, in, in uh, real estate tax is necessary. Um, at least we have some uh, protection for the poorer members of our community who can't pay those um, based on what we discussed um, a year or so ago uh, when we were in the, the high school. I think that's a very good thing. The final thing I would draw to your attention is the importance of these meetings. And I think the police chief really highlighted that today because when you look at that graph of crime during the week, Wednesday nights are the safest. And it must be because all criminals are here at the meeting. Thank you. Mostly at the day. I didn't say when. Um, Okay, is that all that we have? All right, we had two public hearings. Um, the first one is Mr. Dooley. Are you ready? Ready to roll? Ready to rock and roll, Mr. Dooley? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Okay, summary. Um, zoning text amendment uh, or ZTA 2308 is a town initiative to review and amend permitted and condition permitted land use as identified in Article 8, uh, which is the general uh, commercial district. The Columbia Beach Zoning Ordinance to amend the definition of service establishment by limiting car washes as a subtype of service establishment under Article 20, which is our definition section. Next slide, please. Um, at the town council meeting of October 18, 2023, council directed the planning commission uh, to consider the appropriateness of the permitted and conditionally permitted land use as codified in Article 8. Um, the Commission and staff uh, uh, collaborated with the uh, Planning Commission uh, during the uh, meetings of November 9th and December 14th, 2023, on um, reviewing uh, Article 8. The Commission unanimously recommended approval of Zone Text Amendment 2308 to the town council during its meeting of, of January 11, 2024. During that meeting, no public comments were received on the proposed changes uh, to Article 8 or uh, to the definition section in Article 20. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, the commission's recommended changes to the permitted and conditionally permitted land uses in the C1 district zone um, were as follows. Uh, recommended as permitted uses, bookstores, but not adult bookstores, Parking lots, um, except pay to park or valley parking lots, which would be uh, become conditional uses. Service establishments, except for car washes, which is why we would be amending the uh, service establishment definition under Article 20 for definitions. Um, also, uh, watchmen or caretakers units with living quarters who are employed by the business um, that they pertain to. Theaters with a maximum occupancy that does not exceed 70 people and also for medical clinics. Next slide. Um, recommended as conditionally permitted uses that are currently now permitted uses as codified in, our, in the C1 zone uh, include major service establishments, 
Um, car wash is subject to modifying the definition of the service establishment as we talked about. And then staff is also recommending to add vehicular drive-throughs to be included as a conditional use in the C1 district zone. Next slide. Um, at the March 6, uh, 2024 council meeting, uh, the, council, the, excuse me, the council expressed uh, having a more robust discussion on the existing or potential land uses that may wish to add, delete, or append as permitted or conditionally permitted uses in the C1 district zone. Um, the can, the uh, council should be aware that Article 1-7A of the Colonial Beach Zoning Ordinance uh, specifically prohibits any land use not specifically listed um, in a specific zoning district. Um, by reference, it specifically states, quote, only those uses specified shall be permitted in various zoning districts. Any use which is not specified in a zoning district shall be prohibited in that district. Um, in, a, in the event that a use is not permitted in any zoning district, it may be permitted only after appropriate amendment uh, to the text of this ordinance. So fundamentally, if it's not specifically listed in the zoning ordinance um, as a permitted or conditionally permitted use, it's, it's not allowed in the town unless there is a code amendment to allow that use in a specific zone. Next slide. Um, at the town council meeting of uh, uh, April 3rd, uh, the council voted to authorize a public hearing to, uh, for tonight on the zoning text amendment 2308. Um, next slide. It's called impact. Uh, there may be a nominal loss of revenue to the town's general fund for applications associated with land uses that no longer require a conditional use permit. Um, at present, um, it costs $800 to submit a conditional use permit application to the town to process. Next slide. Recommendation. <clears throat> Staff recommends that the town council adopt the attached ordinance ordaining the proposed changes to Article 8 uh, and to the definition of service establishment in Article 20 definitions as part of zoning text amendment uh, 2308 as drafted. There is a, a draft, there is a draft uh, ordinance in your packet uh, to ordain uh, the modifications to our Article 8. Um, what's, uh, I want to emphasize that Article 20, which is the definition section to eliminate car washes as a subtype in the, for the service establishment was not specifically identified, but I want to verbally include that as part of your ordinance uh, consideration. Um, Alternatively, if the council uh, uh, may approach this project by directing staff to make council revisions to Article 8 and or Article 20 and return to the council for final review, uh, if what's being presented tonight is not satisfactory to the council, uh, it can also remand the proposed revisions to Article 8 and or Article 20 back to the Planning Commission for further study and consideration based on uh, council review and feedback tonight or it may retain Article 8 and 20 as currently drafted without any changes. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions of the council. Okay, let's go ahead and do our public hearing and then we'll talk to the council. All right, so we're gonna open the public hearing at 7.53 p.m. Is there anything submitted? Anybody like to speak? Give it all opportunity to the public to speak on this matter. I'll close the public hearing. I cannot the further delay actions. 754. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so council, you guys have any questions? Anybody have any questions for Mr. Dooley? Yes, Ms. Williams. Just one thing. Did I miss it? Did you mention uh, medical facilities? Medical clinics, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. okay. What's your yes, now? That's those permitted use. And I guess uh, I guess you um, tasked us with coming up with any ideas if we thought there were businesses we think should be permitted. Yes, sir. We can think of. I'm not sure if anybody did, but I couldn't think of anything. I just have one. I'm very happy with everything, but I have. I looked at Kilmarnock, which has a small downtown district and has a lot of similarities in retail and things that I think we're actually gap missing right now, but they have. And um, there was one thing, and I brought this up before, but um, that I noticed in their code they address this, 
in their C1 zoning, um, and they put small loan businesses as a conditional use permit requirement. And so I would like to propose adding under the conditional use small loan businesses. Can you define that? Um, and I look up their definition of it right now. Let's see here. Like it's not check cashing. Yeah. Yeah. Check cash. Quick cash. Okay. High interest. Payday loans. Small bit of payday loan. Not a bank, right? Not a full scale. Not BB and T or Truist or um, Atlantic Union or Lancaster, but a small loan business. With this, not me. With that, uh, uh, you're referring to pawn shops or. Would that be part of it or just sort of like a, a You already have cash? pawn shops on there. Yes, so this is just a small loan business and it's exactly, I'm just taking it directly okay. from their code. I'm looking up what they use as a definition for it. But there's a big difference between what a small loan company is and a payday check cashing business is and the interest rates are significantly interest different. Um, so I think I would like to see a complete definition of what you mean by that. I worked for small loan companies um, for many years in my own life. They do have a high interest rate, but it's not six, seven, eight hundred percent APR like it is with some of these other um, payday. Um, okay, so I think we're on the same page about what we're actually trying to target here, not a micro loan business. But the fast, quick cash, the kind of get you full wool over one's eyes kind of cash. Kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking for their definitions on their website, but it's very hard to navigate. So I'm not finding the definitions chapter of their zoning right now. Sorry. Um, I think. Right there. I mean, we can always, um, with the public hearing, we can always bring this back with a definition of, of that. Yes, ma'am. I, I think meets what exactly what Karen's to Karen's point too. Meets that. Staff. We don't have to vote on that right now. Staff believes it would be a good idea to have an appropriate definition because I think this is something in the future that may we want to define exactly what the intent is. I agree. So we can bring that back in the next meeting for the council to consider. Okay. But my question is, once we get the definitions done, will we have enough questions on it? Yeah, that's the only request I have. Is there any other? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know if anybody else has had experience with it, but I had my car break down on I-95 one time and needed some quick cash to pay for it and was referred to one of these um, quick cash companies and went in to talk to them and they were basically getting 30 percent interest per month on lending people money and that's not the kind of thing i would like to see in our town yeah i think it takes advantage of people to be quite frank with you and i think we should force conditions upon our business like that Okay, is there consensus then to have that defined and bring this back for a vote at the next meeting? Yeah. All right, I'm seeing full consensus up here. Everybody's head nodding, so I'm going to take that as a yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, Mr. Duncan. If I find that um, definition, I'll email it to you, Don. I'm sorry. I'm, their website seems to be more difficult than. No problem. Thank I you. I appreciate that. It would be. Okay. Under tab F, you see the memo and you see the changes. And most of what this is is Vivian Giles, who's the town attorney, went through and just cleaned up some language. I mean, there are multiple changes. They're suggested, but they're minor. Um, and I've also suggested some changes, cleaned up some statutory references to statutes, Virginia Code sections that no longer 
consist. Um, but that, that's basically what this is. All right, let's do the public hearing first. Okay, uh, it is 7.59 p.m. Is there any, would anybody like to speak? I invite you. Very welcoming invitation. Okay, seeing none and no submitted emails, we will close the public hearing at 8 p.m. Okay, uh, we've seen this at the last meeting too, and the only change from that time to this time was the fact that Parks and Rec may want to have an event on the beach and then would allow under the conditions of a town sanctioned event, possibly sleeping on the beach. Right. Right. And other than that, everything else is the right. same. Yeah, Madam Mayor, yep. I would like to throw it for discussion once again, since we are um, talking about um, skateboards and rollerblades and stuff being allowed from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. That dogs should be allowed between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. so that our local residents can walk their dogs on the beach early in the morning, even during the summer. Fair point. I would also agree with um, Karen or Dr. Self Sullivan as well. Um, most beaches do have that. Like I think most of the beaches up and down the East Coast that I visited have that. So it'd be kind of an interesting thing to visit. It's open for discussion. Anybody else? Even six to eight. Six, I would want it consistent with whatever other language we have. Can you point out exactly where um, the section on that? I know the fishing um, hours are on here, but I thought skateboarding was just not permitted at all. Page five of nine, section five dash ten, control the animals on public beaches. That's specifically where um, it says no dog access between April first and September thirtieth. Yeah. So at the top, though, see bicycles, skateboards, rollerblades, and roller skates are prohibited from oh tennis sports and blacktops. All right, hold on. Where are we getting? It is five dash four. Uh, deals with skateboards and bicycles. I'm just trying to see if there could be some consistency in this one. Six a.m. and nine a.m. is the unlawful for uh, scooters or out at rollerblades. So permitted six to nine a.m. So the dogs would be permitted six to nine a.m. Are we talking about the dogs on the beach or on the boardwalk? Mm. That's a good question. On the beach and, on the, beach and the boardwalk. You so have to different. be consistent with the other. Uh, I thought the whole point of them not being on the beach is that people don't step in dog turds. <laughs> well, I don't want to be responsible for a dog owner that doesn't it should be there to my dog, <laughs> your dog, and then the case on the beach. I know, but that was the reason for I, I'm just, I'm not arguing, I'm just you saying know, that, that was the reason for I don't know what the original reason was. I thought it was to keep dogs off the beach when the beaches were crowded with people. But dogs are allowed on the beach during the winter because they're not generally crowded with people. And we have improved the I mean, the, the people that the local residents that walk their dog on the beach in the boardwalk pick up after them. You can go out there and watch them. We've added more pet way stations in those areas to make it easier for them to pick up after their dogs. And it's something that the dog owners of this town have wanted for a long time is just give us a couple hours in the morning or in the evening before we can walk our dogs during the summertime on the beach and on the boardwalk. I did have a couple of logistic questions, and please don't tag me as anti-dog. Yes, I don't again. But I do have uh, some logistic questions. So somebody's got their dog on the beach at 901. Okay. Who's in charge of enforcing that? Is that you, Chief? Okay. Uh, that's not an inconvenience to you at all, I'm sure. Okay. And then as far as for those people who are... 99% of dog owners are wonderful folks, but for that 1% that aren't. So who has to clean up the leftovers? And that would be you, Mr. Wright. So in order to put the dogs on the beach for two hours, three hours, we talk to our departments. Am I understanding that correctly? Excuse me, sir. There are already dogs on the beach all the time. And they are. It's it's difficult to enforce that. Sorry. And forgive the question, but please lighten the tone. I wanted to ask the logistics of it, 
because all actions have consequences. And eyes wide open, every council decides, we're going to decide. But I want to make sure everybody has thought it through. So just to follow up on that, what, what are you picking up? Are you picking up after dogs now on the beach? <coughs> are you ha are you are you are you seeing a problem other than the same problem we have now with enforcing dogs not being on the beach at, at the hours where they're not allowed? Is that going to increase? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So right now we have difficulty enforcing dogs not you know dogs that are on the beach during the day. Would allowing them between six and nine a.m. increase your difficulty of enforcing it? No, no, no. It's a, it would be a change in the enforcement rules, obviously. With the, <coughs> I think the majority of the majority of the dog owners uh, locally are very uh, mindful of following the rules. It's, it's a lot of people come. They bring the dogs a long distance, and then you can't leave them in the car. Austin has a question. Uh, my question is, is, is this going to cause us to spend any more money? Are we going to have to get new signs? Are we going to have to do all, all these things to incorporate this? If we're already budget and up to our, our knickers and trying to get things straight, you know, is buying new signs and enforcing new things and doing all that kind of stuff going to be I mean, I have a dog. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm trying to make sure we all are saying this, but I'm looking at it as a cost perspective of what's it going to cost us to do this? What do the signs say now? No dogs. No, 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 no. So we wouldn't be, uh, I think that, I mean, but doesn't it also say no skateboards allowed? And we're changing that? Oh, I don't think it's not a change. I think we're just prohibiting. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't. Sure. So the sign doesn't reflect the actual law. Is that? That's what I'm understanding. Like, yeah, that's right. That's, okay. What about so, considering letting them on the boardwalk? Because that way you wouldn't even have to change signs. Because technically the signs look like you're not supposed to be on the beach. Right. And people can still walk. I mean, pretty significant distance. That's not what just our constituents want. Something just passed that along. They'd like to be able to walk their dog on the beach and the boardwalk during early morning hours or late evening hours during the summer. More inclined to the morning than the evening, personally. Does um, anybody want to make a, a motion or we want to keep discussing it? I make that as a motion. You understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're changing, saying. I, I mean, we could have a, a motion to, for me to go back and make sure there may be a couple of sections involved that may be changing the heading of the section to, to address it. But if, you can, if the motion could be for me to go back, if that's what you want. To allow dogs, dogs on the beach and the boardwalk year round from six to nine. And in the winter time, there's no limit on it. I don't know how it needs to be worded, but that's okay. basically what our constituents are asking for. Right, so let's make sure there's direction for you to work on that, right? So the motion is to go back to um, the attorney and to revise the language to reflect that. Yeah. That's my understanding. Okay, and does that motion have a second? Second. Okay. All right, so now we can have continued discussion and we can vote on that motion and, and see where that goes. I have a question. Yes. So with that, you also want us to take a look at any um, potential cost increases for uh, the design? Absolutely. Yeah, basically the sign now says no dogs on the beach and it could say no dogs on the beach from 9 a.m. till 6 a.m. So you'd have to add that little phrase. So we'll also um, research that and bring that forward um, as part of our revision at the next meeting for the budget. All right, well, let's hold on. Let's see. Okay. Is there further discussion on the motion at hand? Is there any other um, 
think we're not thinking of like any brochures. Is there anything a mention of our dog rules in writing? Uh, probably the website. Just the ones that one of the nonprofits produces at no cost to the town. All right, we're good in the answer here. All right, uh, there probably is on the Visit CBDA website too, and a couple places like that. <coughs> All right, so uh, I'll start on this side. Aye. Aye. Nay. 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 Aye. All right, let's see it. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're just giving you some work to do. <laughs> We want to make sure you stay busy, employed. I, have one well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I apologize. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't notice this last time. There may be, and I, I'm sorry. Uh, the one section, it's page four of nine, section five dash nine point nine. Fishing shall be prohibited by all persons on the Rock Shoreline Public Easement on Irving Avenue. And I guess I could ask council this. I am still learning. Can we extend that to Monroe Bay Avenue as well? I know several people on Monroe Bay Avenue who have cars of tourists or out of towners park on their same you know easement where their docks are, and they start throwing fishing poles. Okay, so Chris is <laughs> proposing a motion to add that language to Monroe Bay Avenue. So I'm just putting what you said into a form of a motion. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Is there a second to second. entertain it? Okay, is there a discussion on that adding Monroe Bay Avenue to the fishing? Uh, <laughs> this is just on the rock shore. On the rock shore. Right? Right. On, right. The, on the jetties and the rocks and stuff, which I know I see them out there fishing all the time. Yes. Um, so it's not another thing that hasn't right. been enforced. But um, What's the exact page number, Chris? Page 49. Section 5.9. It's Point number nine at the bottom. So I think there are also a lot of places on Monroe Bay Avenue where they actually fish from the bank because they can get access. It's no rocks. There are no rocks. Which there. is interesting, though, since the, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. I don't think we want to get into, but with people who landscape on that side and have docks and 99-year lease agreements, it is um, it is not a comforting thing to wake up and see vehicles parked outside of your property and fishing just because there's not rocks there since you do maintain that property and do have a proper lease with town under here. Good for thought. Yeah. I think well, if you we're technically probably, have a lease and that you could have them trespassed, correct? That's a good point. That's probably a good point. I think this is lease. about the shoreline that is public. This, this public talks about easement. public. Right. Yeah. It's public. Well, Whereas the main size is, is public except where they have gotten their lease to and that some of it is private, some of it is public. And that would be in front of your property. So if you have a pier out front of your home on Monroe Bay Avenue, if I drive up and park my car or bike or whatever next to your pier, I'm not stepping on your pier, but I push <coughs> off of the land that is in front of your house you that you lease. have a lease on. Yeah, you do. You so lease the public. extension of your you only um, lease the lines. width of the pier, though. You don't. Mm -hmm. No, if you lease yeah. the extension the of your lot line, is that is that unique to because it's not on the front? It is. All both sides are like that. So we need more information on it. Yeah. So okay, uh, I think the if, if somebody makes a motion to include this, I will vote yes to further discussion. But we need to understand their definition. I agree. So, Madam Mayor, make a motion to add the Monroe Bay Avenue for discussion. Further discussion for Cal to look into. All right, is there a second on that? Or right, she's amending the yeah. motion. And not just the rocks, but the land in front of the home that has a pier, or even not a pier, but just the land in front of the home that they well, especially if they have a lease on it. But even if on Irving Avenue, if they don't have a pier, I don't think it is proper for people to fish out front of that area in front of a home just because they don't have a pier. So, I think. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Kind of. I mean, it's protecting the residents. I'm I mean, trying to think through all the scenarios. I could this could possibly affect. All right, well, it will come back to us, and we'll have more time to consider. We have a town here. We have public beaches. The total. We don't need to fish for fossils. Um. Okay. All right. Well. Uh. All right. All in favor of adding that, or do I need a roll call vote on this? Is this a contentious one to get research on? I'll do a I'll do a roll call. Aye. 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 Aye
I don't have enough information, so I'm going to say nay. It's just for powder research. It's not to do actually just do it. research. Yeah. Okay, so I then. All right, sounds good. Okay, uh, that's it, uh, folks. It's uh, been a great meeting. I'm so glad to spend this time with you here tonight. Uh, see you in two weeks. We adjourn. Thank you, 15.